Speaking to order, uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderman Boyd. Present. Alderwoman Davis. Alderman Ornowitz. Alderwoman Hubbard. Present. Alderman Kotar. Alderwoman Spencer. Present. Alderman Odenberg. Alderwoman Boyd. Chairman Rohde. Present. Four present. Okay, uh, we'd like to remind everybody why we're here and uh, take a little bit about a, a big picture view of the world. What we try to do here in HUDS, we have our own little mission statement and we work to improve the econo uh, assure the economic viability of the city and the well-being of our residents so that those goals aren't necessarily mutually, uh, uh, are totally congruent. Uh, but we are systematically trying to work through a process that begins uh, organizing our efforts. We began by taking a look at incentive reform. We spent several years on that. Last year, we started an effort uh, which is coming close to culmination, and that is developing an economic business plan for a city, an economic development plan. Uh, we will be getting briefed on that at our next meeting on, I believe it's December the 10th. Uh, we have recently kicked off, and those both focus on the economic viability of the city. We want to make sure that when we offer economic incentives, that we actually make money for the city when we do that, and we want to have an economic development plan that, that makes sure that the city is economically viable. So that was our, our purpose there. Obviously, you make a city economically viable to provide better services without money, you know, no margin, no, uh, no mission. Without money, we can't go ahead and make lives better for our residents. Our next thing on the agenda is, is taking a look at housing. We are the HUDS Committee Housing, Urban Development and Zoning. And the housing uh, 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 CDA has recently kicked off or sent out a request, an RFP, for doing affordable housing analysis for the city. And those, uh, we've had several proposals in, and over the next couple of weeks, we should have a vendor for that, which will hopefully begin helping us uh, strategically address affordable housing in, in the city. We have a multiple programs. Uh, the various programs aren't necessarily communicating the best, and we haven't really done a, a very good, in my opinion, cost-benefit analysis of the programs that are out there. So that, that is next on the agenda, uh, and that'll be next year's project. Um, what I think it's really important for us to do, though, is from time to time take a look at the big picture. Uh, we have been trying to schedule uh, outside speakers to come in to make presentations before we take up our board bills. And um, uh, we were very fortunate last year to have Charles uh, Gass can come from the Federal Reserve. They have a tremendous amount of data about what's working in various regions and bench benchmarking one region against another region. I, I think it was a, a fascinating conversation or presentation that we had last year. Uh, this year, um, our, our uh, financial analyst, uh, Professor Hollins, suggested that we have him come back and, and address some of the issues related to workforce development. If we're creating economic opportunities for residents in our city through our economic development plan, one of the challenges we've had is, is measuring that. When you go ahead and create a job for somebody, do they stay in the city and, uh, or do they leave? And uh, ideally, as we're doing this, uh, we are creating uh, an environment where our city residents uh, uh, have a, uh, uh, receive some of the economic benefit that's associated with the economic development that we're doing. And workforce development is a key component of that. So uh, with that, um, uh, uh, Gerard had uh, suggested that we have, have another presentation. So Charles Gaskin, uh, who uh, is the, an economist over at the Fed, has something for us today. We're going to go through that presentation. We always start off with the presentations first. And then we'll come, uh, when he has completed uh, his presentation, we'll go through the board bills. Hopefully by that point we'll have a quorum. If not, we will hear the board bills today and if necessary come back on Friday and, and vote on them. But we want to make sure that uh, all the people who've come down here haven't wasted their time. So with that, um, um, Charles, you want to kick us off and cut, talk through some of the economic... Um, of other stuff that's, that's going on. Um, well, thanks for having me. Just to kind of uh, give everybody a, a, a background of, of what we do at the Federal Reserve. So obviously, we're the nation's central bank. Um, we have 12 offices across the country with uh, a major office here in St. Louis. We have 
about 1,400 employees downtown at, at our office. Um, I work in the research division where we have about 30 staff economists where we focus on national, regional, economic conditions. Um, a lot of it's very similar to what you'd expect at an academic uh, university. So we have many of the professors from WashU and SLU that come in and work with us on a regular basis, as well as economists from about 40 countries around the world come into, the, into our offices here in St. Louis and, and work with different economists on, on research projects. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is kind of, Gerard and I spoke on the phone for about 35 minutes the other day and he gave me a long, long list of, uh, of topics and I kind of pared it down to five things that I thought were, were important that, that kind of take things up at a really high level but um, kind of some criteria to look at to, when we think about evaluating um, economic development within, within this region. Um, these are my own views, they're not the views of the St. Louis Fed or the Fed system, so feel free to ask me any questions that you guys have and I'll, I'll do my best to, to try to answer those. Um, so just to start out, we had a little reformatting going on here. Um, if we think about kind of regional economic growth, uh, the St. Louis metropolitan area, which is the 14 county region um, that comprises kind of about two thirds of it's in Missouri, about a third of it's in Illinois, mostly St. Louis City, St. Louis County, uh, Madison, St. Clair, and St. Charles County is the bulk of it. Um, that metropolitan area has seen economic growth of a little less than 1% over this economic expansion that started in about 2011. Um, that's well below the national average and it's also below many of the this other metropolitan areas in, the, in this region. Um, the city itself is, is been, had has struggled economically for a long time, as we know from population growth, um, and it's no different when you look at the GDP statistics. Yeah, go for it. National statistics, when you talk about the national average, what, where does the national average so fit in? U.S. average is going to be that red line in there. Um, my, I reformatted these to make them fit your screen, so it kind of got a little distorted, but about 2.3, 2.4% is the U.S. average growth. Now, the bulk of that growth is going to be taking place in the western part of the country. So if you look at kind of geographically and you think about the northeastern states, the mid-Atlantic states, they're going to have average growth around 1%. Um, Missouri overall has done, it's done pretty well when you look at places like Springfield and Columbia. Um, St. Louis, Memphis, and obviously in Tennessee are, are two cities that we like to look at in comparison. Both are in our district. Um, both have some of the similar economics, economic struggles. Those areas have really struggled. Um, we look at migration outside of the, like a population leaving this region, what you see is that most of the population that's leaving the St. Louis metropolitan area is moving to places like Springfield or Kansas City. Those are kind of the two big places that the population is shifting to. Um, attraction of population in the region is primarily coming from counties in Illinois and even that into, into Chicago. Um, so that's kind of where this, this growth is coming from. Uh, the weakest parts of the growth in the state still remain in this kind of southeastern portion of the state. Um, and then obviously the, the city shows up in this, this piece as well, but I'm going to dive into that some more. Um, if you look at population growth, I, I want to start with, with this picture. Um, what I've done here is I, I have uh, the population growth for the St. Louis metropolitan area, so that 14 county region, and then a forecast of what we expected growth to look like back in 2000. Uh, the, the first point I want to make is that we knew that this region was gonna grow slower than the national average just because of things like changes in climate and preferences, people moving to the to southeastern states and moving out to the southwest. Um, but we expected growth to definitely perform a lot better than it has. Um, and a lot of what's kind of going on in this background of the model is looking at things like the quality of the housing stock, the, the educational attainment of workers, um, and kind of crime rates and, and all these kind of factors going into it. And if you just take those things as a baseline, that red line is what you would have expected growth to look like for the region. So still 11% growth, slower than average, but we've actually significantly outperformed, um, outperformed that number. So actual growth over this period is 5%. If I break down these forecast errors, and I'm sorry if you guys can't see this on the far end over here, if I break down these errors kind of over by county by county, um, this type of model predicts kind of a, a consistent decline, and I'll explain why we expect long-term decline in population in the city and, why, and kind of why it's happened. This model predicts that you would have this long-term decline in the city. And actually, it, it's off, you know, its city's still underperformed by about 13,000 residents. Um, but the model would have expected that a lot more growth would have happened in, in St. Louis County. And that's actually what's driving the big 
gap between this 11% and 5%. It's that population growth in St. Louis County is, is, has drastically struggled. And I think a lot of that has to do with spillovers from different parts of the region as well. Um, but I, I think this is often missed when we talk about regional dynamics. I think a lot of people often point to the city as, the, as a place of weakness. I would say that there's a lot of linkages that are taking place, but the place that's really carried much of the burden for the region has actually been the county with, with population loss. In addition to that, it's kind of St. Clair and Madison counties in Illinois. Okay, so here's the five questions that I kind of wanted to, to go through real quick um, and, and kind of put some narrative together. Not a whole lot of uh, data in, these, in this thing. So kind of what happens economically if you t were to take like a simple economic model and say what happens when a firm decides we're going to hire 100 workers in, in this city? Kind of what makes up that composition of workers? Where are they located? Um, what happens to building permits and construction? Um, why do business incentives tend to, to not work? Um, what uh, shows up a lot in the literature now is that economic development strategies have really moved toward this idea of workforce development. Kind of, is there traction there? What, where are the, kind of some of the pitfalls that we need to look at? Um, what's the impact of crime on future economic outcomes? Um, and then what's the outlook for the city kind of over the, over the medium or longer term? And I, I, I really do believe that there's a lot of, a lot of promise um, but it's going to cause a lot of kind of really deep challenges that I think are going to take a long time to overcome. Um, but these factors, the same factors that kind of drove the, this demographic, these demographic declines in the region, could also push the population back up. But that's going to cause a lot of frictions that I think we have to be aware of under, and understand what's going on there. Okay, so what happens when a city hires workers? Um, so I'm just going to use a hypothetical of 100 workers, but this is kind of based on data and just kind of mapping it out. Um, basically, 95 of the 100 people that are hired are hired away from other jobs. So these are people that are currently employed. They switch to a different. They switch to a different firm. Um, over time, there's this jab ladder approach that takes place. So you see that some people enter from, they're sitting on the sidelines, they're not in the labor force. They're maybe just graduating from high school, just graduating from college. They're entering the labor force and they're filling some of these open jobs. That makes up three of these workers. Um, get one person that goes from being unemployed to employed. Um, and then one worker probably goes from working part-time to full-time as this demand for workers kind of increases. But a lot of what's going on here is just churn within this pool of people who are ex existing are already employed. Um, if we were to say, like, let's look specifically at St. Louis, and I wanted to make a geographic kind of decomposition of this, um, based on kind of the, the skill breakdown of where the workers are located, where the housing stock is, um, if you hire 100 workers in the city, about 76 of those workers are going to reside outside of the city. Um, and about 23 of the workers are going to reside in the city. If I break this data down even further and you start to look at kind of like the pay of these jobs, the higher the pay gets, the smaller the share of the workers that are residing in the city. It goes down to about 19% if you get into kind of jobs that pay over $50,000 a year. Um, so that's kind of the dynamic that's going on. And I'll talk more about kind of why we see this. Um, the other thing that we're going to see is I kind of already talked about the job part, education breakdowns, you get the same thing. This has to do with like what's the skill composition of workers um, or the population that's looking for these jobs. Um, housing demand. So what you see is as this firm hires workers, the demand for housing goes up. The reason the demand for housing goes up is that people potentially have higher incomes. There are a few more people that are employed. Well, where the housing stock is actually going to become the most affordable is going to be out in the outlying areas. Because if you're adding construction and adding jobs in the city, pro relative property values in the city tend to go up. So the, the ability to build housing in that same area tends to go down. So that actually is this combination effect that pushes people further out into the, out into the suburban areas. And that's where you actually see the construction take place as you, as you hire these workers. Um, when you look at migration into the region, it takes a really long time to get this reallocation and have people actually move in. So six to eight years out is where you finally start to see kind of the long-term shifts of migration, assuming that these jobs are long-lived and, and, and it's perpetual. 
So that's kind of the dynamic that takes place when you think about if we add people, where are they coming from? And a lot of it has to do with this friction that takes place in that the people who are in the labor force will churn over, but actually trying to get these people that are on the sidelines into the pool of workers is really, really difficult. And it's not just a matter of creating jobs that's going to bring these people into, into the pool of workers. And that kind of gets to why some of these business incentives that, that we've seen over kind of the last 30 years have, have struggled to work. Um, first of all, they don't seem to have, the research has shown they don't seem to have a big impact on business location. So it's quality of workforce, other amenities that seem to have an impact on that. Um, so if it's just kind of like, is it a deciding factor? It doesn't seem to be a deciding factor in many cases. Um, like I said before, few jobs go to residents who are not employed. Um, at the low end, maybe one in 10. In some cases, you can get up to maybe 30% of, of um, people who are not employed picking up these new jobs that are created. The downside of that is these are jobs that are typically created that are in like leisure and hospitality, really low wage jobs or entry level positions. That's when you can get up to the 30% number. Um, otherwise, you're looking closer to 1 in 10 of these new jobs going to people who are not employed. Um, when you do get migration into the region, and we don't see this ar ar around here as much. This is definitely something that we've seen more in the southwest and, and in places like Nashville. But when you do get a lot of migration into the region, from a public standpoint, about 50 to 90 percent of the increased revenue that you're getting from the new business formation is getting offset by additional costs due to kind of infrastructure and spending and things like that that has to take place to, to, deal, with these, uh, to deal with these costs. Um, and then kind of the last part is when you think about kind of like what types of firms you have, um, if these are firms that we consider to be non-tradable where it's just like you're selling in the local market, when you're bringing those types of jobs into the region, it's usually just offset by like job losses in other areas. So you open up a new restaurant in one location, the workers decide to move from one restaurant to the next, the other restaurant goes out of business and you're basically in the same position you were before. Um, when you look at tradable firms, that's where you can start to get some of these kind of longer term benefits and that's where um, as you have narrowed down these incentives, that's where there's been a lot of focus. Um, but when you look at tradable firms, so this is going to be somebody that's producing something and selling it outside of the region, there's a really big difference in what the regional economic impact is going to be based on the ownership structure of the firm and um, where they're kind of where they're investing in, in their markets. If it's just a branch of a firm or if it's something something bigger. So these are all kind of, you know, I think pretty straightforward things to, to think about. Um, but the details end up really matter when, when we start to think about even something like ownership structure. Is this an employee-owned manufacturing firm that's coming into the region where everybody's incomes are going to go up, they're going to build more housing, that's going to have a significantly higher demand than if it's a national firm coming in, opening up a headquarters or an office and hiring local workers, but most of the profits are, are potentially leaving the region. Um, so that's where kind of things like ownership structure can really matter. Okay, so kind of where do we focus then from an economic development strategy? Um, some of the research or some of the work is saying, well, you need to focus on economic development organizations investing more into research um, so that they can understand regionally what some of the key challenges are and opportunities and that like national studies and national reports kind of have big catch-alls, kind of like the last slide I showed you. Like those are really big high-level things. They're not going to point to exactly what's different about St. Louis City, St. Louis County, or strategies that might work in certain even segments of the, of the city. Um, In-house expertise is really critical for understanding details and assumptions that go into incentive packages. Um, I like to take, I live in University City, and as you guys probably have seen in the newspaper, there's a big economic development project that goes in, and we were fortunate to have one resident that actually sat down and looked through the details to realize that sales tax allocation wasn't done the way that it was supposed to, and there was a higher cost to this, this program that they were trying to have for this development on Olive um, than what the city thought. These things happen all the time. Yeah. A resident determined? Yeah, so a resident went back and worked through all of the... Um, 
paperwork and realize that like the sales I, tax pool. We'd like to kind of <laughs> kind of circle yeah. through me if we could. Yeah. Why don't we hold the question? Yeah. If we could make notes, and we'll hold the question. Everybody will have a chance to. So I think I, I know this. The city has done a lot on this, and you guys have you brought in a lot of people that can kind of sit down and understand like what consultant packages look like, what national assumptions are being used, what things are really unique about this region or this area or even this you know, ward or this census tract that make it so that this policy can't just be picked up and placed in someplace else and, and why it might fail. Um, that's what in many successful cities they've really started to focus their kind of regional economic development groups on. Um, when you start to think about workforce development, um, some of the things that have focused on is having incentives identify ways that you can, cities and, and state governments even can focus on the building the talent pipeline part, which is going to benefit maybe the firm that's locating into a region, but also many other firms that are in the region. Um, so kind of building in this human capital infrastructure becomes, becomes important. Um, and that's a cost that we've seen corporations take on more and more of. Um, in some of our last surveys and even in some of the statewide surveys, you see that the number one thing that, that businesses are doing now is they're hiring workers that don't have the skills for the jobs that they need, and they're investing a lot in them to get them up to the place that they need to be. That's a place that, that government can come in and say like, well, these benefits are gonna impact our entire region, not just your firm, because eventually these workers are gonna leave. Um, so we can share some of those costs with you and see the benefits. Um, the other thing in, in the cities, in, in like large metropolitan areas and cities, this has gotten better. Um, in smaller communities, it's definitely a big challenge. It's how do you connect the education system with the business community? If you go to, particularly in small towns, it's, this happens all over the place, where you have businesses that don't go to schools, you have students that are graduating high school that don't even know what businesses are located in their communities. These are huge challenges and huge issues that, that, that can be addressed by just having development organizations do a better job of you know, connecting firms and, and, and education institutions together so people can understand what opportunities are out there. Um, Facilitating equitable hiring practices is another one. Making sure that firms understand kind of what can happen with implicit bias, that um, as you start to look for workers with certain qualifications, if you grade your jobs too high, you narrow your pool of workers down to the point where you can't fill positions, and you also can't measure kind of skills that become really, really important, such as like communication skills and problem solving skills that don't, you can't identify those until you get somebody into an interview. But if you grade your jobs too high, you narrow the pool of workers that you even consider for interviews, um, and then you miss some of these people that may otherwise be, be well qualified and, and well suited for jobs. Um, and then experimenting with kind of new talent development systems and, and kind of identify key sectors and regions where you can do kind of controlled experiments to say, well, this, pro this program seems to work well for our region, this one doesn't, and, and here's, here's kind of why, why that is the, the case. Um, so is workforce development the, the future of economic development? I'd say in the short term, we have a really low unemployment rate, so the demand for workers is really high. Um, there are some places, though, that we know that there are structural um, shortages of workers, such as in like skilled trades and in nursing, that those are going to you know, perpetuate for long periods of time. So those are opportunities to, to, um, to focus on some of these programs. Um, but many times they don't focus on kind of how do we get people that are on the sidelines that are unemployed into finding employment. Even in some of these education programs that you put together, it's really more about upskilling than it is about kind of taking people who have no skills and getting them at least into an entry level job. So it's just saying, well, we have people that are kind of in minimum wage jobs and now they want to make more to support their families. We're going to put programs together to kind of help them do that. Many of these people are already really motivated. They're already looking for opportunities. You can help them along, but that doesn't do anything to get the people who are already unemployed into the labor force. And that's where kind of some of these long-term structural changes have to, have to take place. Um, access to qualified pools of workers is consistently cited as kind of the key factor for firm location. So building up this pool of workers, if you want to say like what helps determine where firms are going to locate. 
pool of workers is, continues to be the number one factor, and in, increasingly so um, over time. There are a lot of challenges with with workforce development. So we've seen this already with kind of talk about, you know, we needed to get people into college, that there's this great premium for, for sending people to college. Well, what's happened as a result of that is that we have many institutions that have, you know, great four year, six year graduation rates that are under 50%. People have a lot of student debt. And more recently, what we've started to see, and actually some of my colleagues just put out a paper on this, is that the return to college as more and more people have gone, it's just gone to just higher quality institutions. So the, yes, it seems that there's this big premium for investing in education, and it's true, it exists. But if you miss, if you send people there and they can't, they don't, they're not able to graduate because of personal reasons or family struggles that they have, they take on a lot of debt, they're in a worse position than they were before, and now you're just seeing this bigger premium for these higher quality institutions on, on the gap. Um, Job training programs often suffer from kind of economic and, and racial inequities that are taking place in the region. This can be as simple as saying like, people can't get to this location to get the training that they need. So you have to think about the simple things as like, what's causing some of these challenges in getting people to job training programs? Access to childcare at job training programs is another one that shows up a lot that's often overlooked. And that's the kind of the bigger struggle to, to get people into, into these jobs. Um, in Louisville, we have a board of directors, and um, one of our directors is um, on the Urban League of, of Greater Louisville. And they put together a program to try to get people into construction jobs, because they know that there's this great demand for construction jobs. So they got about 40 people through this program that they put together. Come to find out, most of the people can't take the jobs in construction because they have personal family reasons, they've got kids they need to take care of, older family members that they need to take care of, and construction jobs require that you move around a lot, particularly if come some of the high-skilled jobs. So while it seems like you can say, well, we know there's a demand for construction jobs, just because you get these people trained in through the programs, they can't actually take the jobs because they have all these other family structural issues that, that make it difficult to, to meet the demands of the work. <coughs> Um, and last but not least, when you look at kind of where firms are investing their money in training, it's mostly on the highest skilled workers that they, that they have. Um, and then last but not least, we had a, a round table at the bank back in the spring um, with economic development agencies from all around the St. Louis area, from the regional chamber to the St. Charles County Executive uh, economic development group to kind of some very skilled uh, niche groups. And what I came away with was, again, shortage of workers is the number one thing. We've seen at the state level kind of changes in, in strategy. But when I asked them, I said, why don't you do more on workforce development versus business attraction? They would tell us, well, our incentives aren't there. That's not what we're asked to do. That's not what we're tasked with. That's not what our mission is. So. It's also a matter of saying there, there are these organizations that have identified these as problems, but they don't feel like they necessarily are empowered to address these, these, these challenges because that's not where their incentives currently lie. So I think that ultimately becomes a big, a big piece to this. Um, okay, so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. Um, let's talk about crime and what that means for future economic outcomes. I'm just gonna take two papers here that I think are um, capture a lot of stuff that, that we see. So one um, came out in 1999. Um, it's by Stephen Levitt, who some of you may recognize his name. He wrote the book Freakonomics. Um, so this was one of his seminal papers that he did. Um, and basically what he find was, found was that each additional reported crime in a city is associated with a one-person decline in the city's population. Moreover, without getting into all the kind of statistical ways that he was able to kind of get the causality. He was able to identify the fact that the causality goes from higher crime leads to po depopulation, not that depopulation tends to lead to higher crime. Um, moreover, we know that people with higher education tend to be more mobile. Those tend to be the people that are leaving. People with kids are also the people that are responding to these higher crime rates. So if you start to think about kind of what the impact of crime is on a region, it's that you're losing high edu highly educated and, and young kids from your region, and those are the kind of the key factors that you need for productivity as, as well as long-term long growth. Um, 
And there was this other paper by a, a colleague at the Cleveland Fed that came out more recently. And this one I found to be really fascinating. Um, and it's a super interesting paper and I wish I could spend an hour just talking about it because he was able to kind of identify some things that are really important. Um, you could take this all the way to like what the impact video games has on kids. Um, but what he was looking at is like what does the exposure of violence um, do to kids' um, high school outcomes and their trust in institutions. Um, and he starts by noting from this data set that he's, that he's using that 8% of white males and 26% of black males have seen someone shot before the age of 12. And that those numbers go up to 15 and 43% by the age of 18. And what he finds is that if you see somebody shot, your participation in violent behavior on the street or nonviolent behavior like stealing at a grocery store or something like that is driven primarily by exposure to this violence early on in your life. And this is controlling for things that we know are important to kind of like what other factors that might, con that might impact this, such as like what's your mother's age of birth, the amount of time that you spend in child care, child care, what the crime rate is in your county, all these factors kind of controlling for that. This exposure to violence has a huge impact on kids' trust in institutions, and that leads to kind of lower high school graduation rates, and when people get into the labor force, less hours worked. And just to kind of show you in a picture what this looks like, it's the same across all demographic groups. So if you look at the chart on your left here, this is males engaging in violent street behavior. Each of the solid lines on the top is of a different, uh, different race, so black, white, and Hispanic. Then the dashed lines are those people who did not experience any of this stuff. So you see that these trends are the same no matter what your race is. Nonviolent street behavior, like I said, is gonna be things like stealing, shoplifting, um, getting kicked out of school for one reason or another, suspensions, things like that. Um, and again, these big gaps show up. Um, and we know that these have impact on like depopulation of the region. It also has an impact on workforce development um, because these are pe what, they, what they find in through the kind of digging in the details of the paper is this has an impact on trust in institutions, how you, how you solve your own problems. Um, and if you move people out of these formal structures, um, it's really, really hard to get them back in. So what does this mean for kind of, kind of some of these pieces and some other stuff? What does it mean for the outlook for the city? I think the, the number one place that we need to look to when we think about the outlook to the city is housing. Um, and there's a lot of research that's been done on the role of housing and economic development. And what it finds is kind of starting with this paper in 2005 is that the combination of, of cheap housing um, and low skilled, attracts low skilled households to declining cities. And the reason that that happens is that if housing prices are, the market housing prices are below construction costs, you can't build any more housing because you're just gonna lose money the second the house is built and it's sold. Um, so that means that you have this existing housing stock that's there and it continues to depreciate, but people are gonna live in it and the people who are gonna move into that are gonna be people with lower skills, lower educational attainment, and that's kind of what's gonna fill in this, this housing stock. But again, because the houses exist, people will still live there. So it's not that people leave and then their house goes with them. So that's why population declines take really, really long times to actually play themselves out versus like shocks to population increases or shocks to demand on the, on the flip side can kind of really turn places around really quickly. Um, some of the other research shows that kind of there are positive spillovers for the entire region by reductions in blight. Um, those spillovers push all the way into kind of outlying um, county areas. Again, that's because the main place for jobs to get the highest return is when you locate them in central business districts. Um, but the housing stock tends to move further, further out. So um, that plays a role. And then this other paper by um, Bruckner and Rosenthal I mentioned at the, at the end, I think is, it's really important to note, which is what they find is that the relative age of the housing stock within a metropolitan area determines where high skilled and low skilled people um, tend to locate. What you saw over the last 30 or 40 years was that the age of the housing stock was significantly younger in the outlying suburbs 
That's what pushed high skilled workers out into these outlying areas. That's equalized over time. Now we have many areas where most of the new construction, a lot of residential development is actually taking places in areas that used to have relatively old housing stock. Um, that pushes people back into the cities and we're seeing that over time. It's not just this thing that you hear in the newspaper about like preferences of millennials to be in areas where they can walk to work. Like, yeah, there's a little bit of that, but it has to do with the fact that people want new housing and it becomes increasingly affordable to build new housing in central cities because the housing stock in the suburbs is just getting older and it's less desirable. So people don't want to buy a house that was built in the 1980s and have to gut rehab it because um, the cost is just really, really, really high. So they'd rather buy something that's a lot cheaper, has maybe potentially more character, and do it at a, at a lower cost. What that means is that you expect to see cities kind of regentrify or increase gentrification over the next 20 and 30 years because there's going to be this equal, equalization in housing prices between cities and suburbs. Um, so I think it, from a population growth standpoint, it means that you're gonna, we're kind of getting to this turning point. But it means that I think from a political standpoint, for sure, there's gonna be a lot of different issues that, um, to, to kind of deal with as a result of that. Um, so just kind of wrap up, I think development strategies, they often just ignore some of the fragmentations that take place in, in society. Um, and they lead to high cost and, and benefit and little benefit. So you think you're bringing in all these new jobs, but you're just really resorting the resorting the deck. Um, and households make the neighborhood decisions based on the quality of the housing that's available to them and what what crime looks like. Education is a and I know we hear a lot about schools and school choice being important. That kind of falls into the background after these two things. So education, quality of education is ultimately becomes a result of like what the skill levels are of parents and what the quality of your housing stock looks like that brings those people in and that changes the school quality. Uh, measures of school quality tend to be very biased because of those factors. So it's kind of housing quality and crime that determine where people end up locating. And then yeah, workforce development is, is definitely necessary. Um, but I think structures of existing organizations and, and some of the metrics that, that they may need to focus on to, to, to achieve some of these goals are not, are not currently aligned. Um, and then the last piece is that kind of the solutions that you see in other cities that may have worked, oftentimes and most likely will not work if we apply them to this region. This is what um, economists just what won the Nobel Prize on actually, which is you can do these controlled experiments where you say like, What's the impact on, um, some of them look at like, what's that impact on uh, uh, attend uh, elementary school attendance if you start paying for free breakfasts, right? And in some places they find that if you give people, bre kids breakfast at school, high school or uh, elementary school attendance goes up and outcomes go up. But what they find is that like, it works in that specific school district, it might work in one specific community because there's underlying factors that are causing this to be a problem. Maybe it's long commutes to work, allows parents to get their kids to school at a better time, but you can't take that and apply it to another city and expect to get those same outcomes. So what that means is that the research really needs to be done within the region to understand what will work for the region. It's not a matter of just taking what's worked in other places and expecting it to work. Oftentimes it's just not gonna work. Um, and so I, I'll, I'll leave you with, with that. Are you open to answering a few yeah, absolutely. questions or Love comments to. by the committee? I, uh, I'll start it off with, uh, since we are in the, our committee is, much of our business here is in the incentive business. I want to get clear, um, uh, and I think there's a distinction, and I guess maybe I'll challenge you or ask yeah, you a absolutely. comment, I'm not sure which. When we are, I, I think there's a huge difference intra-regionally versus inter-regionally. We spoke briefly yep. about this before, before your presentation. Um, if, if we are, for example, looking at incentivizing a shopping center, which I don't believe is a particularly good investment when you talk about inter-regional competition, but incentivizing a shopping center inter-regionally could certainly help one municipality over another municipality when it comes to the economic viability of the, of, uh, of the municipality trying to incentivize it. In other words, 
we at local government pay a lot of our bills through sales tax. Yeah, absolutely. And 50% of something is better than 100% of nothing. And um, while incentivizing retail may not be good from a standpoint of regional economic development, it might very well be good from the standpoint of a the economic viability of a particular municipality within that region. Yeah, uh, so I, I, I guess yeah. I'm asking you, would you? So I would, I think that that's a, a sound logic and I hear it a lot. Um, I would, where I would push back is to say, there's an assumption in the background that is, we need the, the, the revenue in order to provide better outcomes for our residents. And that's why we want to provide these incentives. Um, I, I think what I see as I go through the, the literature is that A, regions that rely on sales taxes for, for most of the revenue tend now, to grow a lot You're saying slower. regions, now I'm talking about municipalities. Same, so. same, same oh. thing, yeah. Aggre aggregate up all municipalities. Places that rely on sales taxes tend to really struggle when it comes to overall economic performance. And this is the reason why, which is, what, what I talk about here is that if you want to improve outcomes for residents, the focus is on how do you, you know, take residents that are not attached to the labor force and get them attached to the labor force? How do you make sure that you have quality housing stock and low crime rates in the region that will allow residents to continue to live in the region and find opportunities? As a result of doing that, you get retail. The retail comes in because there are residents there that have, you know, desirable places to live, have been, been able to find jobs, and as a result of those investments, the other stuff comes along. That's well, the, this is an age-old argument in economic development. Do, do oh, rooftops so I don't think follow it, jobs or do jobs follow roof, rooftops? Jobs yeah. follow people. Workers. Uh, well, uh, so if you bring, in, in the same, if you look at what would happen, if you bring in a lot of jobs into, into this region, and it works okay for the city's finances because of earning taxes, which is if you bring jobs into the city, the people that take the jobs are already employed. The people, once they get the jobs and they have higher incomes, they have incentives to move out to the suburban areas where they have higher quality housing stock, lower crime rates, and as a result of that, the sales tax revenue, if that's what you're looking for, is moved to some other places. Well, I guess the point I would make is, is last study I saw is the St. Louis City loses about one out of three sales tax dollars to the suburbs, which if we were able to capture that, that would make a significant. But why, I guess my question is why focus on capturing sales tax when you would, I guess from what I see, the focus is on how do you get unemployed people into employment? How do you get people to want to stay where they're at? That's, I guess that's where I say, the sales tax piece comes along as a result of those focusing well, there, on those uh, If you take a look at how we balance our budget, in the, I'm sorry, this is yeah. turning into a debate, and I want to... Uh, oh, it's, uh, it's okay. My, my one point, yeah. and I had one other question uh, for you, is um, the one point I would make, and I don't want to get in the debate with yeah. you now, I Absolutely. enjoy our conversations. I'm story. happy to do the, the, I guess the, the comment I make would be is, is if you look at how the city pays our bills, there is a huge transfer of wealth from we, we typically tax businesses more than what services they require, and then we take that tax, and that's how we go ahead and pay for things. So when we go ahead and, and bring... Oh, that's, I, I agree. That, I mean, the public finance incentives can distort what I view as to be the economic incentives for what should be done. And, and, and so, and, and... Well, I guess the point I was trying to make is, is, is if I understand your point correctly, if we, uh, I would agree that we're spending too much resources and comp competing intra-regionally, yeah. but are you saying that, for example, inter-regionally, that, um, for example, uh, retail, which I consider a zero-sum game, uh -huh. but manufacturing where we export outside the region. Um, Again, I think if you were to bring a manufacturing plant into the city, if these are high-skilled, high-paying jobs, 
to the extent that city residents take those jobs, without the ho housing stock in the area, they move, and the, ho the construction and the sales tax revenues move out. So what That's, you're saying the investment should be in housing stock then? I, I think that w when you see investments in quality housing stock, that tends to keep things at a at the level that you attract the residents uh, uh, of the region. Uh, yeah. Which is kind of interesting. We, we did a, uh, when we did our initial economic <coughs> development study, the conclusion of that was, was that we should be incentivizing jobs more than housing, and they were actually kind of critical of... of but, okay, so that's, so I would say the city is, and this gets to my last point, which is not that you have to incentivize, incentivize housing. There are structural things that are in play that have driven the demand for housing in the city up significantly. So it's not even the case that you have to incentivize it. We were talking just a minute ago that if you look at the places in the St. Louis metropolitan area that have the fastest housing price growth, there are uh, zip codes in the city. If you look at the places in the Metro Tower Grove Park area, in that area, fast, and this is repeat sales too, so like really house asset appreciation. If you look at the places that have seen the fastest year over year population growth, it's actually downtown. So some of these things are already taking place. It's not necessarily that something has to be done to incentivize them either. So I, I think that you can look at it a, a couple of different ways. But structurally, the decline in, in the housing stock and other outlying areas has benefited the city all already, and we're seeing that development taking place. Um, but the workforce piece is what ultimately ends up keeping people um, allowing those people to get hired that are unemployed and having the housing stock and, and ultimately the education piece is what keeps them in the city as they gain employment and their incomes go up. So, Okay. Um, so that, I, yeah. Always enjoy our conversation. Yeah. I don't want to dominate the, the conversation too much here. Let's, uh, Alderman Boyd, do you have any questions for our speaker today? Only question I have is, is there a copy of your presentation? Absolutely. I, Gerard has it. He can send it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, if Gerard would email it, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. No further questions. Um, Alderwoman Hubbard, Hubbard, any questions? No questions. I'd just like a copy of the presentation, too. Yeah. Alderman Kotar? No questions. Uh, Alderwoman Spencer. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, I've, I've, and thank you for being here today, Charles. I think your presentation was fascinating, um, depressing, but fascinating. Um, the second slide where you showed the St. Louis growth, the GDP yeah. uh, versus the rest of the region and yeah. some other uh, comparable cities, that 0.8%, that's an annual growth rate? Average annual growth rate for okay. the metropolitan area, yeah. We'll okay. have the Bureau of Economic Analysis will release in December detailed county level data at the sector level. Um, so we'll get a, a lot more information about kind of what's going on within the metropolitan area. They've been working on the project for about two years now, so. You just mentioned some zip codes that saw a significant amount of growth, some of which were in the city. I think the Business Journal just put out an article on that, um, the 20 fastest zip codes growing. If my recollection serves me, I think there were only two areas in the city of St. Louis out of that list of 20 uh, that were located within the city of St. Louis, the vast majority of zip codes that saw fast growth were in St. Louis County and St. Charles County. So let me let me talk about that. I think if you look at um, median house price or sales price appreciation, you get a different number than the way that I would prefer to measure it, okay. which is to look at repeat sales. So it's got to be the same house that's sold multiple times so that you keep the quality the same. So part of the reason that you can see like fast price appreciation in certain areas is because you just, you're building newer, higher quality housing and that pushes up those, those growth rates. If you look at repeat sales, it really gives, gives you ideas of where land values are appreciating um, in addition to the housing stock. And so that's the way that I prefer to look at it. And that's where you see some yeah. of those differences. Uh, in addition to providing the... Uh, presentation. Could you also provide a list of the, the sources cited, yeah. some of which were noted in the presentation, some of them were referenced, yep. but if you could provide that, I would be very grateful. I have about 400 more questions. Would you be available? I have uh, a card. Okay. I, can give you, I appreciate that. I'll, I'll save those for one. Well, Charles had an excellent presentation last year for mm -hmm. those who haven't seen it. Um, I can send that to you guys too if you don't have it. But. Um, we have several members not on the committee. Did, did an, any non-committee members have any questions they wanted to ask or? Uh, no, but that's oh. fascinating. Thank you. 
sorry. Thank you. I'd like to be a little formal. Um, professor, did you have anything, that any comments you'd like to make today? Or? No. no? Thank okay. you. He's probably going to call me up afterwards. The, uh, for, uh, St. Louis, uh, for, for those uh, uh, not familiar, St. Louis Federal Reserve is a, a remarkable resource of the 12 federal banks. St. Louis Fed is uh, probably second to you New to New York's Fed uh, and has a long reputation of being an, uh, very much of an independent source of research. So, uh, the state of Missouri uh, has a unique distinction of actually being home to two Federal Reserve Banks, one here in St. Louis and one in Kansas City, and that is a result of, uh, uh, and I guess it was 1918 when the Federal Reserve Act was passed, the same year that the Federal Income Tax Act was passed. The uh, chairman of the Finance Committee in the House was Champ Clark, who was a Missourian, and uh, that was a, con that was a uh, requirement that he have uh, two Federal Reserve Banks uh, in the state in order to in order to establish the Federal Reserve, which is perhaps one of the most important things that have led to the economic uh, strength of our country. And it's hard to imagine not having a Federal Reserve Bank, but for well over 100 years, we did not. So uh, in any event, thank you so much for your presentation today. Uh, we really always enjoy your insights, and um, I'd like to follow up with you as well sometime and kind of make sure. we. Uh, we present these speakers not necessarily that we always agree. I always agree with them, but I think they, they force us to examine what we're doing, and we, we learn a little bit from each of them. And uh, I think some of the things that, that Charles brought up, we are very, uh, our, the whole purpose of the economic development plan that we're developing is the idea of how do we customize some of these things to our unique situation. And, and so they were looking very much at our unique strengths. So I think at least in some ways, we are, are moving in the right direction. With that, let's go ahead and actually take up our business at hand today. And um, we have a number of board bills. We typically hold the ones that are um, uh, by members of the committee uh, till the end. Uh, and uh, I guess first on our list here is Alderman Gunther with board bill number one. Th oh. We now have a quorum, I've been reminded, and we should go ahead and take a motion. And uh, we have uh, actually an agenda before us. Um, the chair will entertain approval of the minutes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I move that we approve the minutes uh, from the October 16th, 2019 meeting. Second. It's been moved by the alderwoman from the 20th, seconded by the alderman from the 22nd. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderman Boyd. Aye. Alderwoman Davis, Alderman Ornowitz, Alderwoman Hubbard, Aye. Alderman Kotar, Aye. Alderwoman Spencer, Aye. Alderman Odenberg, Alderwoman Boyd, Chairman Rohde. Aye. Five aye votes. Okay, now that we have the minutes approved, I'm sorry, Alderman, now we can go ahead and take up your board bill. Let's take up board bill number 131. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, hearing Board Bill 131 today and the members of the committee. Um, Board Bill 131 uh, is something that a bill that was recommended by the uh, planning and zoning. Um, essentially, uh, the property located at 423 Lynch Street a couple of years ago was purchased by uh, what was American Eagle Credit Union. Um, they have now yeah. switched their name uh, and their branding to Together Credit Union. Um, when they purchased the land, it was multiple properties. Uh, they went through some zoning issues with trying to get some signage uh, and a drive-through and a couple things that zoning recommended that they combine all of their parcels of land into one. When they combine their parcels of land, uh, then they had the uh, different um, uh, zoning uh, designations. So uh, this is just a bill recommended by zoning to ask that we go from K unrestricted to the J industrial district for one single site at 423 Lynch Street, which is, I believe it was three different properties all combined. And you can, on the third page here, there's a kind of an outline parcel that is the current land. So um, with that, I'll take any questions. Uh, any questions of the alderman from the ninth? Uh, alderman uh, Boyd. No questions. Uh, alderwoman Hubbard. No questions. Alderman Kotar. I guess my only question, maybe this is for the zoning commissioner, looking at exhibit A, um, do this, do the honorary, is this just a glitch? Do the honorary street names 
Uh, they have Shannon's, Jack Bucks, and Shannon's. And the Clyde Cahill Junior Drive all yeah. the way down to Soulard. Do those? Yeah. Is that just a computer error? Do those street names really extend all the way down? Okay. Yeah. I was just curious. I wondered that also, Alderman. No I was, further questions. You know, that's it. Um, yeah. Alderwoman Spencer. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Alderman Gunther, what is the purpose of the rezoning? What's going in here? So it's already there. Um, the American Eagle, uh, now Together Credit Union, purchased <laughs> multiple pieces of land. We're combining them in order to combine them all for some signage and different things. We want to get all the zonings the same on multiple parcels of land. Got it. So thank they're you. going from yeah. unrestricted to industrial. Great. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I forgot to announce earlier, all, uh, Alderman Oldenburg was uh, called out of town, so he uh, we uh, asked for he has to be excused. If there are no other questions, the chair will entertain a motion on board bill number 131. I move that we adopt board bill 131 with a due pass recommendation. Second. Previous roll. Move second, request for previous roll. Hearing no objection, we'll consider board bill number 131 as uh, heard and passed out of committee with a due pass recommendation. Um, Thank you, Mr. Alderman, Chairman. Alderman, as long as you're up, why don't we go ahead and finish you up and okay. take up board bill number one. All right, let me grab those papers. 155. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board again. I do have a few handouts here. Uh, the first handout is the <laughs> And then the second handout here is from SLDC, which is the scorecard. As the handouts. Um, so yes, uh, thanks again, Mr. Chairman, members of the HUD's committee. Uh, Board Bill 155 um, is the issuance of uh, taxable industrial revenue bonds uh, for Anheuser-Busch Inc. Um, what we are hoping to do here is to uh, be able to issue uh, $100 million of taxable industrial uh, bonds to be able to um, create a new uh, subsidiary of Anheuser-Busch to be able to uh, reuse some of their current uh, manufacturing products, um, putting $85 million into equipment, uh, $15 million into the renovation of an existing uh, underutilized building, uh, and then this is also kind of goes along with Anheuser-Busch's global sustainability initiative. So um, if it is okay with the chairman, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Ted Powers uh, with Anheuser-Busch to come up and talk about the presentation that he has. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, I will, um, I'm Ted Powers with Anheuser-Busch, the Director of Government Affairs, and um, the presentation today, I uh, wanted to give a little bit of background on the uh, project. Rob Haas will do that, our Global VP Operations and Engineering for for uh, ingredients, and then Neil Wishhouse um, from Duff and Phelps. He's director of site selection uh, for and incentives for uh, Duff and Phelps. So I'd like to call those two up, and they'll give uh, give you a little background on this project. Thank you, Chairman. Members of the committee, thank you for the chance to testify here on behalf of this bill. Uh, I'm Rob Haas. I'm the Global Vice President of Engineering and Operations for our new ingredients division that we hope to be able to bring here to St. Louis. 
want to talk to you about uh, the, the project and uh, in support of the long history of this. For 165 years, Anheuser-Busch has been one of America's leading manufacturers and employers. We're proud of our history and our heritage. We're honored to call St. Louis home. Uh, across Missouri, we employ over 3,500 people at 10 facilities, 700 of those here in St. Louis at our brewery downtown. Ever since our founding, we've been focused on the quality of our beers and the quality of our people. And our company is built on the belief that these two go hand in hand, and that's why I'm honored to here today to share our plans for creating local long-term manufacturing jobs through the reuse of our existing brewing materials. Part of being a leader in the brewing industry is bringing new innovation to meet consumer demand, and we're happy to report that we're rising to the challenge. This proposed project, supported by Board Bill 155, positions the St. Louis Brewery as a leader among all the Anheuser-Busch facilities. Our plan for potential expansion of the brewery builds on our company-wide sustainability initiatives through the creation of new products from our existing brewing material streams. The proposed plan will create more than 40 good paying manufacturing jobs with an average salary for those jobs of $120,000 annually. That's a total annual salary incremental increase of $4.7 million that this project could bring. More details about what exactly we'll be creating from this existing bring materials will be shared soon. For now I can share that Anheuser-Busch seeks to create a brand new subsidiary with manufacturing and R&D that we want to bring with this project. The company would be headquartered next to the St. Louis Brewery, and the company will be at the forefront of introducing new innovations across all of Anheuser-Busch. And before I close, I want to uh, quickly speak to our commitment to sustainability. It drives everything we do, and it really inspired this project. As a 30-year veteran of Anheuser-Busch, I can tell you this is the most exciting project I've been part of. As many of you know, we re recently launched very ambitious 2025 sustainability goals focused on renewable electricity, carbon reduction, water stewardship, circular packaging through recycling, and smart agriculture. Our plan for the St. Louis Brewery represents the intersection of innovation and sustainability, bringing good paying jobs to St. Louis, and positions Anheuser-Busch as a leader in the brewing industry. Sustainability isn't just part of our business, it's really a core value of our business. So in closing, we look forward to sharing more details about our plan with you and with the St. Louis community. In the coming months, we know that investment and job creation are the engines of economic growth that drive this country forward. And as the leading domestic brewer, we're proud to play a part of that. Our plan for expansion only deepens our commitment to this community and reinforces our strong belief in creating and bolstering good paying sustainable jobs right here in St. Louis. With that, I thank you and we'll take any questions. Um, the so, uh, just so we understand, the, the $100 million bond issue, that, uh, that, that's a recommendation of SLDC, uh, and that is used, in essence, as a prop, pro personal property tax? Could, could you kind of explain what the, what the cost or the benefit is? Uh, uh, the, uh, My name is Mark Spikerman. I'm, Alderman Gunther knows this I, yeah, as well. Him, uh, he knows it just as well as I do, probably. Uh, well, I, I apologize, Alderman. I'm professional. Uh, my name is Mark Spikerman. I'm an attorney at Gilmore and Bell. I represent the city on, on these type of projects as bond counsel. Uh, chapter 100 refers to the, the chapter in the revised statutes of Missouri that permits uh, industrial revenue bonds. These specific type of bonds are not intended to finance to actually finance the improvements. Anheuser-Busch, I'm sure, is capable of financing that themselves. But they do facilitate the tax exemption and abatement. The, essentially, the bonds are payable. The city takes title to property. It makes it tax exempt. They lease it back to the developer for the tax abatement period. Uh, there's contractual payments in lieu of taxes during that period. And, uh, and the bonds are issued to make sure that there's consideration and documentation of the cost. At the end, uh, th those bonds are payable only from lease revenues paid by Anheuser-Busch. They are not payable from any city tax dollars. And at the end, everything unwinds, property goes back to on the tax rolls. And I'll, I'll add a little detail to that as well. So the, uh, um, so what are we looking at here? So the uh, Chapter 100 bonds allow for 
um, for them to purchase the property with the exemption of the state sales tax. Um, so by using the Chapter 100 bonds, uh, they get the, the sales tax exemption on the $85 million of new equipment that they're going to be purchasing. Um, this issuance also allows them uh, to look into or to be able to proceed with a personal property exemption. So we have in the bill there uh, for five years, uh, they get an exemption on 75% of their personal property purchased. So that's the new equipment that they'll be using for the manufacturing and the research, both. Um, and then the third thing that it does for them is that uh, this bill allows them to uh, take uh, 115, 120-year-old building uh, that is largely vacant right now uh, to be able to rehab that with $15 million and take a parking lot that is a parking lot and uh, build a, uh, a new uh, research facility on that as well. So um, for the uh, restoration of a 110, 120-year-old building and the new construction uh, and putting uh, some of their space to, to use, we are going to be offering a um, five-year 50% real property abatement on it. So um, so that's what the, the bill allows with, through the use of the Chapter 100 bonds. It allows them to kind of hit those three incentives to uh, hopefully draw this uh, new business to St. Louis um, and the jobs and the earnings with it. So, Have we gotten to the point where we use, uh, does Jonathan run something like this to the model? Or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. There's a model uh, hand out there. Uh, yeah, and on the model, we have our this star is system. Financial impact. Which, which? Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yep. Okay. We uh, uh, we like to hear from our own analysts when we do this. So if you yep. don't mind, right we'll have uh, Jonathan run through this for us. Good morning. Um, yeah. So John Ferry with SLDC. Um, so yeah, looking at the uh, the numbers I ran on this. Um, this project is expected to generate over a million dollars, $1.3 million to the city, uh, primarily through um, the new, um, through the new earnings tax, I guess, primarily. And then, um, so it, it scores very well. It gets 4.75 out of five. Uh, there's not really a way to evaluate the, uh, you know, the rate of return to the company on this because uh, it's it's not primarily a property investment it's primarily a business investment so um, we don't have any of the the data to be able to to evaluate that um, but overall uh, from a cost benefit standpoint to the city this this is a, a good return it makes sense uh, Jonathan you just heard a bit of our conversation with um, Charles from the um, uh, Federal Reserve, and we were talking about intra-regional versus inter-regional. This, when we're doing something like this, most of the revenue that's going to be coming from this is going to be coming from outside the re region, I guess, is, is the right. point I'm yeah. trying to make, as opposed to some of the projects we do, we're actually kind of shuffling. Sure, yeah. So uh, actually in our strategy that we're putting together, um, we've identified three sort of types of businesses. There's traded businesses, which is where the um, majority of the uh, transactions are coming from customers that don't live in the region. There's um, regional uh, business clusters, which are generally things like uh, business services or health care uh, all the customers essentially are generally coming from within the region and then there's neighborhood level businesses. And so those are generally going to be uh, smaller um, businesses, a lot of times restaurants and retail and that kind of thing. Things that don't generally draw from all over the region. So. Okay. Um, did, did you have anything else in your presentation you want to make or, or are you okay for us to go ahead and present, uh, uh, provide uh, committee members questions or? I'd be happy to answer any other questions. Okay. But, um, yeah, like Why don't we go ahead and go through the committee then? Uh, Alderman from the twenty um, second. Any questions? Sure. Um, first question is: Is there a summary page on the amount of money that comes back to the city of St. Louis? So I know you're not giving the full um, hundred percent tax abatement. So what portion of that? annually over the life of the tax abatement is coming back to the city. Uh, um, New revenue. I believe. Uh, 
attached to the board bill, you'll find a plan for industrial development and cost benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. And if you flip, uh, which we, I guess is page 11 of 15 of Exhibit A. You'll yeah, see, was... yep, you'll see by taxing district. Now this is over the entire abatement period, summed up. But... So the city uh, receives three, well, right. Almost two million in, in payments in lieu of taxes are made over the course of the abatement period. Uh, the city's share of that is uh, 364,000, okay. uh, and that's prorated based on the city's tax levy versus all the other taxing districts' levies. The school district gets the most part. And then if you look at um, the exhibits that follow, they break it out by year. Okay, so basically the city will net over just over $300,000, is that correct? And, and that's over just the life from, of abasement. That's just from personal property tax abatement. Mm -hmm. So that's not counting the earnings taxes and the other taxes that they, uh, utility taxes and whatnot that they would get from, from expanded industrial facilities. But the pilots include that, don't the, doesn't the pilots include earning tax? And no, the, the pilots refer to only payments in lieu of personal property taxes. Oh. They, the earnings taxes are not abated, the utility taxes are not abated. Those would, those have not been necessarily measured in this cost benefit analysis, mm -hmm. but they would, uh, they would flow. So you didn't do a calculation on potential earnings tax revenue? That would be factored into, uh, yeah. Uh, the company estimates roughly 120,000 annually in earnings taxes, what? earnings and payroll taxes. What page is that? It's within the presentation. Yeah. Our presentation. Their okay. They ran on the presentation. Okay. Um, so, is the state sales tax going to be abated as well? The uh, the the state sales tax will be abated because it's manufacturing equipment. So, Department of Economic Development are they on board with this? Uh, th this one, yeah, they're they're fine. This is statute. So they have no choice but to approve right. it if we do this. Right. Okay. I'll also, uh, Alderman Boyd also mentioned that, um, uh, which is not in this bill, but we did look up, they have a number of different sites on their campus that they're looking at. Um, I took a look at uh, some of their um, proposed uh, pieces of property. Um, the one that looks like we might be leaning towards uh, right now is currently paying $125,000 a year on, prop on real property tax on that building when the other uh, parts of the property that was in there is close to $800,000 a year currently. So those will stay the same. Um, that real property tax will, will still stay the same, but then the $50 million in improvements on it are just going to be a bit of half of that uh, increase in the set value. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, I misspoke. The, the payments in lieu of tax are payments in lieu of real and personal property taxes. Okay. Uh, I just want to say, um, Alderman Gunther, I am impressed with your enhanced knowledge of incentives, <laughs> especially <laughs> tax abatement. Um, I, I, and I mean that I, sincerely. I, I'm, I'm impressed with you were able to um, educate us on as much as the lawyer. So, okay, no further questions. Um, Alderwoman Hubbard. No questions, just a comment. Uh, I definitely want to commend you on your uh, efforts and your learning curve <laughs> in regards to uh, incentives. Uh, we, as a city, we definitely have to sometimes go above and beyond to attract uh, development in our community. And while some people like to sit on Twitter and really don't understand how things happen and how we uh, spur growth in our community, I commend you for being open to it and um, definitely AB has been a staple in this city a long, 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 long time. And if you all are trying to expand or do anything else in North St. Louis or the Fifth Ward, I'm open for business. <laughs> so, thank you. Congratulations on that. Um, Alderman Kotar, any questions? Yes, a couple, Mr. Chairman. Um, I know you, you mentioned, Dan, that you guys have kind of narrowed down, I guess, to what building, if this goes forward, what building we're talking about on the campus, can you share that with us? What I'm generally familiar with the campus. 
Uh, yeah, sure. So you're familiar with the St. Louis Brewery campus. Yeah. Uh, there's a building we, we term as Warehouse 6. It was built in the late 1800s as a brewing building with uh, full of fermentation vessels. So it's built very, very well. Um, it's uh, seven floors, 36,000 square feet. Um, it's seen its better days in the past, so our plan would be to rehab that and turn it into a purpose building for the process side of our new ingredients okay. company. Give me a general idea. Where is it? Just I don't I don't know by Arsenal. name. Go oh, east down Arsenal. Yeah. Right when you cross over 55. Yeah. The first building on your right. There's a parking lot and a oh, okay. story building. Got it. It All has right. a, we'll a an eagle right there on the uh, corner of it. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. My next question is probably for Jonathan. Um, Ferry. Jonathan, I don't know who did this summary page, but it references, you know, we've done some a similar structure for Hoover Farm. I remember that deal down in South City and Square. Um, you know, those were a couple years ago now. How are those projects performing, you know, with a similar sort of incentive structure? How would you, How are, those are, they, are they meeting their expectations? Um, I don't have the data on those projects right now so I don't I don't know I could have to find that out and get back to you okay Otis is approaching from the rear yeah I'm approaching from the rear uh, Otis Williams SLDC so you may uh, be aware that we in the course of doing our incentive uh, analysis we determined that in uh, to quantitatively uh, uh, analyze all these projects which we're doing but we also wanted to hire someone to be able to be an asset manager to be able to track this, to get mm -hmm. the data that you just asked about. So at this point, we don't have it, but we can research it. But where we are, we've just hired someone who is going to be able to do that. And what we want to do is to be able to put it on uh, our website such that each of these projects that we incentivize, you can always see where we are. Okay, great. Thank you. Nothing further. Uh, Alderwoman Spencer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I do have a couple of questions. This is a little bit confusing. I'm not used to these types of incentive structures. Um, the way I'm reading this, uh, looking at Exhibit 1, the cost analysis, uh, this is a bit, the total value of abatement is around 990000 for the city of St. Louis and $3 million to the St. Louis Public School District. And then the return is around 1.2 million to the city, but 1.3 million to the school district. Is this a net cost to the school district? The, the, the total property tax levy in the city, about 65% of it is the school district's levy. So they are the most affected taxing district by property tax abatement. When we look at the cost benefit of these, um, you know, taking a look at what the return to the city is, and this is probably a question more for Jonathan in the model, uh, but, you know, are we looking at uh, the holistic approach, you know, a holistic approach of what it's costing not only the city as an entity, but our school district and our other taxing districts and making sure that, you know, that those ent other entities that, you know, uh, lose revenue because of abatements um, are made whole by the investment? I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan real quick. I just want to, uh, one caveat, the cost benefit analysis attached here, I consider it more of a static document. It's, it's, in, a, it's in a format that the statute requires. Jonathan's analysis is much more dynamic and I think getting at what you're asking. Sure. Uh, so when it comes to the, the school district, we do calculate the um, sort of the, the net cash flow that's going to go to the school district. We don't uh, have, for example, um, a way of, of estimating what the school district's overall needs are, you know, based on like a given property to say like this is how much revenue the school district would need from a property like we can say for the city. And that's because there was an extensive amount of modeling that went into um, figuring that out for the city. and required an amount of data that just isn't available from the school district to be able to calculate that. Yeah, and, but perhaps uh, uh, my question was uh, not very clear, and it's perhaps more general in nature, but when we're uh, looking at tax abatements and carving money off of what would otherwise go to the school district, when we're looking at whether or not these incentive packages make sense for the city, the city is uh, carving off a smaller percentage of what the, of, of the overall, I mean, we get a smaller uh, percentage of the overall abatement than 
the, the school district. Correct. So it, uh, in situations like that, we could it could make sense for the city as a single entity, but looking more broadly as the, at the city, the school district, which serves our residents and other things like that, it's a bigger question of whether or not these things make sense. And I want to make sure that we're taking a broader look, not just for this project, but for projects in general. Yeah, the only thing I can, I guess, really say to that is we do show what the net revenue is going to be to the school district. So we always try to make sure that that's at least going to be a positive number. I, right? yeah, it is I, certainly possible to be negative. Um, so this net revenue, net new revenue is on top of replacing the three million that it's costing the, the, the school district? Yeah, that's on top of, that's, that's after the incentive. Understood. Okay, that's very helpful. Uh, I join my colleagues in uh, uh, appreciation for the work AB does and um, the jobs that would be created uh, by this and, and keeping your headquarters and your uh, a large amount of your facility here. I run by it every day. It's a, it's a, it's a great joy to smell the beer. <laughs> uh, both. I, I, I like both. Thank Al you, Mr. Chairman. That's all the questions I have. Thank you, Alderwoman. Uh, Alderwoman Boyd. I don't have any questions. I just want to applaud Dan. I want to be like you when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, AB. I guess. <laughs> and I and I want to thank AB for staying in our community. Thank you very much. The uh, alderman from the seventh pointed out that our colleague from the uh, ninth is uh, one of the stars of our presentation here. On looks like it's page three or four. So um, I, I didn't know that you did modeling in your spare time, Dan, but... Um. I, I will make the point to say that uh, every year Anheuser-Busch gives generously to Habitat for Humanity, and uh, we have an entire day where their employees come out and build uh, multiple houses for Habitat for Humanity on their parking lot, put them in shipping containers, and then take them to sites and erect them, so they, uh, they give very much. And, and I love building things, so yeah, that's my... There I am. <laughs> Great, Dan. Thank you. Uh, if there are no other questions, the chair will entertain a motion on uh, board bill number uh, 155. I move to pass board bill 155 out of committee with a due pass recommendation. Second. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Oh, we have a new member amongst us, so I guess we ought to go ahead and uh, call the roll, Madam Clerk. Alderman Boyd. Aye. Alderman Davis. Alderman Ornowitz. Alderman Hubbard. Aye. Alderman Coltar? Aye. Alderman Spencer? Aye. Alderman Odenberg? Alderman Boyd? Aye. Chairman Rohde? Aye. Six aye votes. Congratulations. Thank you all. Thanks for your commitment to the city. Um, next up, um, the alderman, alderman from the 24th could, uh, had to leave and has asked the alderman from the 6th to uh, take up his bill. It's board bill number 133. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I am here in front of you today on Board Bill 133, which is a rezoning um, in the 24th Ward at Bruno and Forest from A single family to C multifamily. Um, on that land, currently, um, there is a one detached two family unit, two attached single family units, and two vacant lots. Um, the developer plans on consolidating the five parcels and offering 21 attached townhomes for sale um, at a total cost of around six million dollars the developer is not seeking abatement just the rezoning here and i'm happy to take questions we also have mary hart with zoning as well as the developer if there are more specific questions i cannot answer um mm -hmm. boy just stepped out uh Alderwoman Hubbard, any questions? No questions. Um, Alderman Kotar, any no questions. questions. Alderwoman Spencer, any questions? No questions. Uh, Alderwoman Boyd, any questions? No questions. Um, having no questions, the chair will entertain a motion on uh, board bill number 133. I move that we adopt board bill 133 with a due pass recommendation. It's been moved by the alderman from the 7th. Second. It was seconded by Previous the roll been a request for previous role. Hearing no objections, we'll consider Board Bill 133 heard and pass out of committee with a due pass recommendation. Thank you. 
Um, as is the case, uh, as is tradition, we'll, uh, uh, we'll go ahead and hear the bills from the folks who are not on the committee. We have several bills by committee members. Um, that will take us down to board bill number 168, sponsored by the older women from the 26th and 28th wards. Um, I'm sorry, Alderman. Go ahead and proceed. Okay. All right, I think great. We got Good morning. Thank you. So, um, Alder, the Alderwoman from the 20, um, from the 26th. You're good. Um, are here on behalf of board bills 168, 169, and 170, and these are regarding a, a development plan in the Skinker de Bolivar neighborhood. It's actually kind of on the corner or on the border of the Skinker de Bolivar neighborhood and de Bolivar Place neighborhood um, neighborhoods. And you've got a, a map there in your packet outlining the development area. So this is regarding there. Um, there are three bills, and do you want me to go ahead and are all three of them up, Chairman, or? What? Why don't we talk about the project kind of in okay. general, and then we can go good. ahead and handle the bills sequentially because I know that they're all related, but they um, do slightly different things. Yes, thank you. So um, this project overall is a very exciting project um, in, in the Skinker to Bolivar neighborhood. And what it does is um, it looks at the, if you can think of where the Forest Park Metro Link Station is right now, there's a uh, bi-state-owned parking, surface parking lot, and then there's a strip mall there. Uh, there's some transit offices in there, and then some sporadic retail has been in and out of there. The, the strip mall is a, a persistent problem property. There's been a lot of calls for nuisances specifically around, around security there. Um, there are two very dense, diverse neighborhoods right there, and this is a very underutilized spot in, in the neighborhood. Um, and so what this project is, it's a TOD, a transit-oriented development project. It's really about getting more people um, closer, more greater, increasing access to public transit, um, bringing in a grocery store. So it's about approximately 183 to 200 unit apartment building, and I'll, I'll bring the developer up to share more details on on that um, but this really is a, a dynamic project for this for this area um, bringing in like I said the grocery store and some apartment units and what it does the reason why we're here there is a TIF that is being proposed for this and the reason for that is that this project has to replace the current surface parking lot for the the metro um, so this project is going to be replacing that with an underground um, parking facility so maintaining all of that free parking for the metro as well as um, adding underground parking for the residents and for for the grocery store um, so that's why why we are here on this project and so the three board bills the first one 168 um, designates this as the forest park transit oriented development redevelopment area 169 um, is the redevelopment plan and then um, 170 is is the TIF, and so this is a 19 million dollar project, 91 million dollar project. I apologize, 91 million dollar project, and what we're looking at is um, a 1.4 million dollar SID along with um, the 12.6 uh, million uh, TIF, roughly. Um, so, and I'm happy to bring up the developer to talk a little bit more about this. Again, I think that what this project does is really enhance this neighborhood. Um, there's just a lot of missed opportunity right now in that neighborhood. Developer Place is a very 
dense area. Skinker Bolivar, like I said, is very diverse, and it's um, in between the Central West End and the Loop area, so you've got a lot of residents there who would really benefit from the amenities that this brings, and it's just getting more people on the street. If you've been in that stretch, um, it's always surprising to me that when I walk around that metro station that you've got all these people living here, but there just aren't the services or the amenities, and really to be able to get more people riding um, our, our public transit is going to be a benefit in terms of security, in terms of um, environment, in terms of health and in terms of economic growth. Um, so first, actually, I'd like to bring up um, the Alderman from the 26th in case she would like to add anything because this project does span um, both the 28th and, and the 26th wards. Oh, the other thing I do want to mention is there has been extensive community engagement on this. So um, Pearl Development reached out to the neighborhoods well over a, at least a year ago and have had several meetings with both Skinker de Bolivar Community Council as well as the de Bolivar Place neighborhoods. Um, they've been very engaged in terms of the design, the layout, talking to neighbors about traffic and I will say they've made several um, several adaptations to the original design um, including originally had a building on on the east side of the project map there and and they've had to scrap that for various reasons but they've also made adjustments to the type of housing that's that's available um, there will be in addition to the the apartment units on um, that face to Bolivar there's gonna be some walk-up units on the Giverville, which is a, a single family block. And so they're really working to adjust this project so that it fits with the neighborhood and it provides a variety of housing opportunities. So I do just wanna mention all of that extensive community engagement that has gone um, into this process up until now. Alderman, is there anything you'd like to add? Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, that was one of the main things I wanted to echo is what my colleague just said about the community engagement. We have had several meetings, not just community meetings, but they've been open to meeting with us and answer our questions as well along the way. Um, I grew up in this neighborhood. I not only patronized this um, mall, I worked in this mall before myself, so I saw the downfall of the area and I am very excited about this project and um, how it's moving forward. On the second page of the handout shows you my little piece of this project because of course uh, the 28 Ward does have the lion's share of it. But I'm excited and proud to be a part of this um, planning process as well for the kissing ride lot, for the Metrolink kissing ride lot that um, if you look on the picture it's over in the right hand corner and um it's still going to be a functional kissing right lot where they are working together they um told me just this morning that they are going to work with former alderman scott ogilvy metro link to try to i'm sorry and metro to try to um do more connectivity between forest park and st um R great rivers greenway so i think that is really good um as far as how it'll work with the cohesiveness of that neighborhood what I will say is, again, with the community engagement, I've been encouraged with the fact that I think that they um, are being as inclusive as they can be with the project. Also taking into account talking to little old me, because y'all know I'm a freshman, but they answer all my questions and they um, see the importance of including um, the community in on this project, the community that might not be able to live or, uh, I guess, I guess live is a good word, live right in the community, but because it's next to the metro, they'll be traveling through it. So it will be um, open to all kind of community members and constituents, neighbors that'll be in the area. So again, I wanted to definitely be here this morning. I've been, I made it a point to be at all the meetings um, so that they know that I support them 100% on this project and I look forward to hearing more on it this morning. Thank you. I just wanted to add um, one more thing too, just to give you a little bit of background. This is a site that has been um, reviewed and evaluated for, for years. Um, other developers have tried to make something work on this site and have not been successful to date. Um, there was also the, the TOD plan for this um, has been in the works for a while. Um, so, and I think that's on page three, it discusses a little bit of the analysis that has gone in and some of the planning. And so really what's wonderful now is that the timing is, is ripe to do something here um, with everything that's going on. Again, as, as my colleague mentioned with um, Great Rivers Greenway, we've got um, you know the Metro, all of the improvements at Forest Park. They're really, this is really, I think, a, a wonderful time to start considering this project, especially in light of what we heard earlier in terms of the growth that is so desperate 
desperately needed in our city. So with that, um, I'm willing to um, bring up anybody that um, the committee would like to hear from. We've got well, Jeff Tegetoff from Pearl. Get, oh, yes. At some point into the financials, but yes, if I could, I just want to make sure I understand the site plan. They, it looks like they have several different renderings here, and I, are those... Are there multiple conceptual renderings so that you haven't settled on one yet? And then you have the site plan, and I'm trying to figure out how the renderings tie together with the site plan on page four. Okay, so the rendering that you're seeing like on page three is from the TOD study. So that's just an example of what was contemplated um, you know, several years ago. The so, pro proposed project area on page two, that shows, um, so in that black line, that's what's in the 28th Ward. The Kiss and Ride lot that the Alderwoman referenced over in the bottom right corner was originally going to be built on, originally it was going to be apartments, and then when it didn't look like that was feasible, maybe some other sort of um, commercial space there. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I'm sorry. When you say the bottom right corner, could the you? Circle. Where that circle is. Where that's, circle. Yeah, that's, the, that's currently owned by Bi-State, and that's a Kiss and Ride lot to drop people off for the metro station. So, so that is... That's in the 26th ward? That's in the 26th ward. That but piece is. But is that part of the... So, and I don't know if, if, um, if somebody else wants to, to address this. It's given uh, some infrastructure challenges. What is going to happen on that site has been up in the air, but that is part of the purchase. Okay, so that, that is part of the redevelopment. So it's not just the, the area in the L-shaped Correct. It, it, that, that black line should extend and include that kiss and ride lot. But not the building to the, I guess that's what's, the, Yeah, what's located, what's labeled Ocean Grill, not that building. Okay. So then what is the, the site plan looks like on page four so yeah, so what you're seeing there, so that's all on the west side of DeBoliver. That's the piece that's in the 28th. That is where construction is proposed to occur. So on the northern parcels there, that's the, um, the residential. Well, there's most of that's res both of those. So you've got a couple of buildings there. And then on the south side, you've got additional residential and retail. And the walk-up apartments I mentioned facing to Giverville are on the westernmost parcel there. And then on page five is the rendering for the currently proposed project. So as I said, the one on page three is just an example of what was proposed um, several years ago. And then page five is what Pearl is currently <coughs> proposing to, to build on that site. Okay, and then the, the... So that's standing at the Kiss and Ride lot looking west. Okay. And then... I noticed the trolleys on then the kiss and ride lot is is what's going to happen with that then you want to fill in what you know about that so, right. thank you. so the, what i was saying earlier is that that's um still in the planning phases and what i learned this morning again is that they're working with uh former alderman scott ogilvy um about maybe plans to make that area more cohesive with saint uh great rivers greenway and forest park um Forest Park. Again, but not taking away the functioning piece of it of being a kiss and ride lot of drop off station for the Metro Link. Okay. But so, that, of course, that, Metro that is involved is as well. Within the redevelopment area, so that's it, within the bills, that's. That's the that parcel. Yeah. And then the retail center up there, uh, this project says that it's going to have 30,000 square feet of retail space. Is that right? So I'd like to bring up Jeff Tegetoff from Pearl Development to answer those questions more definitively. <laughs> Hello. Hi. I'm Jeff from Pearl. Uh, I was just curious about the existing retail, how much was there and how much, uh, how much is being replaced and what your, did I hear a grocery store earlier? So. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not sure on the exact number of square footage that's there currently. Um, <clears throat> both of the buildings that you see represented in our rendering, uh, in the site plan, will have commercial space in them. So I'm assuming we're going to be adding additional commercial space. I, I doubt it's 30,000 feet there. I'm just not sure. Uh, 
Okay, well, the, the, it says approximately 30,000 square feet of new commercial space. Does that mean that that's going to be net new commercial space, or is that? That's, no, that's ours. That's uh, not net. Okay. All right. Um, I was just trying to understand. Do we know will there actually be more retail space than what we've had there before? Than there will be. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, do you have any other prepared presentation before we bring Jonathan up or anything else you want to add before we go to the financials? I don't think so. Is there anything you want to and no, I, th I think now is probably a good time to bring Jonathan up. Okay. Jonathan? <laughs> See, it's in the picture. All right. Um, does everyone have the uh, the report in front of you? Um, so yeah, this project uh, we starting out looking at the rate of return to the developer. We found that um, uh, that the return without any incentive is below uh, it's the low end of the normal range for uh, these types of projects within the region. Um, and with the incentive, uh, it's, it's still uh, at a reasonable level, um, not even quite getting to the midpoint of the range. So um, in that respect, we think that uh, it meets the but-for requirement of the TIF statute. Um, for the revenues to the city, it's uh, expected to generate about $7.4 million in gross revenue over the first 10 years. Uh, $3.3 million of that would be captured and re-diverted uh, by the TIF. Um, the substitution effect on that, uh, we estimate at about $2.3 uh, million, uh, leaving net revenue to the city of $1.7 million. Uh, the baseline, if there was nothing done at this project, just with the existing retail and the existing um, property tax being generated, we would be about $206,000. So net new revenue is uh, $1.5 million to the city and about half a million to the school district. Um, so all in all, the, the project is, uh, we believe, sustainable to the city over the long term. It gets a three and a half out of five um, on, our, uh, on our score. Um, and you can see the uh, sources and uses on the right. It's a $91 million project. And the TIF represents just under 14% of um, project cost. Um, I forgot to add, we forget the, um, the representative of the controllers here at so many of these meetings. We always like to hear from him and make sure that the controller's on board with uh, <coughs> uh, Tom Ray Armstrong Teasdale. I represent the controller and she is on board with this. She supports the project. We've reviewed the documents that are appropriate for them. And, and remind me, we always like to ask you on the TIF projects, but do you, you review the tax tax abatements as well or just usually the I do the tax abatements okay. also okay so you everything we've done here everything we're taking up here today Tom I don't even want to overlook you or ignore yes. you Tom I'm sorry sometimes we go through these things I get a little distracted but you're you're on board with all, all the yes, board bills today Th thank you very much we appreciate hearing from the comptroller as we do deliberate um, let's go through the committee then uh, Alderman Boyd any questions sure um, so, maybe I missed this, but tell me the use, is it a CID or TDD that's coming <coughs> with this package? It's a, there's a CID. A CID. Yeah. And I mean, it's a TOD, it's a transit-oriented development, but as far as the taxing district, it's going to be a CID, a CID. And, and what would be the use of those funds? So a big, the, the biggest, the reason that we're doing this is because of the replacement parking by, by Metro that's required. So right now there's free parking mm -hmm. for the Metrolink station. Mm -hmm. And per the agreement with, you know, with Bi-State that that parking has to remain free. They have to maintain the same number of, of spots. But um, Dave Richardson, would you like to come up and supplement? Sure, I think uh, Dave Richardson with Hush Block. Well, yeah, the Alderwoman, uh, you know, answered it correctly there that again we have uh, parking spots so it's structured parking costs is what the CID will pay for 
So, I mean, just from the rendering I'm looking at, I'm guessing there is a parking garage going to be built, or will it still be um, surface parking? So there'll be a little bit of surface parking kind of behind one of the buildings, yeah. but the bulk of the 440 spots are structured parking spaces. And the structured parking spaces that are on the uh, property closest to the uh, Metrolink, mm -hmm. those will actually be, you know, underground and so that you can park there and get on the Metro and actually it'll be accessible now where you don't have to, uh, you know, go down an elevator. The parking will be oh. actually graded with, um, with the tracks. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm going to ask a dumb question. Yeah. How many affordable units are in this project? This is a market rate project, mm -hmm. um, but we did, as part of you know working with the community, we looked at the um, overall affordability in the census tracts around there. <coughs> and right now, 54% of the uh, rental uh, rental units in the census tracts of that neighborhood are affordable. So the neighborhood has uh, a lot of affordable housing right now. And this project should relieve, you know, what this neighborhood has experienced that we understand from working with the community is there is, you know, some gentrification that has occurred. And if you look at um, studies on TODs, one of the good things with TODs is that, um, and this product, it will relieve some of that stress because, um, you know, with a new product coming on, um, you know, as the economist said before, it, the shiny new bobble gets is where people want to live initially. So um, some of the pressure to um, upgrade or convert some uh, multifamily uh, that's affordable right now in the neighborhood will be relieved because there'll be a new product, um, new housing here. And again, we're not replacing any existing housing. This is just surface parking lots and a blighted shopping mall. So, can you tell me a little bit about the type of units? We have single, um, not single, uh, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom. What are the rates, projected rates? So we'll have um, 112 basically studios called the Econo Suites. We'll have 131 one bedrooms, 35 two bedrooms, nine three bedrooms, and then as the alderwoman says, there are some um, walk-up units along to Giverville as well. And Tell me about the, the market rate rents. So the rents are anticipated about about $2.40 a square foot when we open. Oh, so and that, and so in, so, sorry. Uh, and the average size unit's about 645 square feet. So the average rent's about 1500 bucks, $1,500 to $1,600 a month. So tell me what, what a studio would cost. So a studio could be uh, 450 square feet. So then that would be about $1,000. $1,000, okay. Um, I'm, I've said this before and I'm gonna keep saying it until there's some change. In Central West End, we continue to build up because we can't grow out. And market rate in the Central West End for studios typically starting to become 11 to 1200 dollars a month which is that's not affordable at all um, even though this project is not replacing any affordable units there are some affordable units uh, within that neighborhood what will happen in the future is those who are probably paying the affordable rates will move out and then we'll become more market rates and then we're not gonna, I don't see how we're gonna sustain affordable units in the Central West End. And I'm not trying to pick on the Central West End, but I'm trying to have a more open view of development opportunities in the city of St. Louis and where we tend to focus a lot in uh, the Central West End with these TIFs and uh, most of these incentives North St. Louis and some parts of South St. Louis, there's just continued disinvestment. People just don't want to build there. But if you move, start moving more north of Del Mar, I think you can create some really nice neighborhoods, rebuild some really good neighborhoods. And, and Dave, this is not a lecture to you. This is just Jeffrey Boyd commentary, okay? And it just becomes frustrating. And I know there are a lot of people that are sick and tired of hearing, okay, they're the, 
black people yet again complaining that you know they can't get development in their ward, but yet um, we just feel left out. Um, and I know we can't make people spend their money in our neighborhood, but what we can start doing is not supporting these type of projects. And if we start not supporting these type of projects, then it will force developers who want to help bring people back to the city of St. Louis to reinvest in our, neighbor, our struggling neighborhoods. Um, it's always easy to do the easy stuff. I would much rather give a 50-year tip if I could to somebody that's want to come into a struggling neighborhood. Um, I appreciate that we're starting to look more in center reform and we have this map and if you're doing more than a million dollars, um, you know, maybe you get 20 years tax abatement in Wells Goodfellow. That's encouraging. However, it needs to be promoted more and we need to start moving developers toward those new opportunities. I have seen no concerted effort by anybody working for the city of St. Louis to do that. And I'm not trying to really pick on anybody, but I'm just telling you, while I get excited, truly excited about stuff like this, and wouldn't mind living in an environment like that, I'm frustrated that we can't have something like that in my neighborhood and in the Fifth Ward and just basically in North St. Louis and some struggling parts of South St. Louis. Um, I don't know what it's going to take to change this mindset unless we just shut it down in the HUDS committee and we just no longer support these type of projects. But then maybe that's not fair. You know, that may not be a practical solution, but something needs to change. Something needs to change. I get tired of voting yes on stuff like this only because I can't have it in my neighborhood. And will I vote no? No, I'm not going to vote no on this because I think in the, the big pictures it's good for the city of St. Louis. But at what cost to the neighborhoods that people like me represent, where the housing stock continues to crumble? It's not fair. It's not fair at all. I'm, I'm really frustrated about that. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Williams, did you? Oh. Did you I'm sorry, uh, Alderwoman, I didn't want to preempt you, but. And I, I, this is Otis Williams, and I understand the alderman's frustration. But I, the, the good news is I think that we are about to turn the corner on alderman. And in fact, yesterday at uh, LCRA, with the passage of your request, and we had a couple of developers who then came to us to talk about that. But it's also a part of the, our movement uh, as we get the equitable economic development strategy, as we are talking to a lot of people. If, if, if you. I know we always say more time, but uh, if you work with us on, on this, I think uh, we will see better days here in the, over the next year. Okay. I, you know, I, the, one of the things that's, that's important is that the, the team at SLDC understands that there's uh, areas of this city that is has not seen the kind of development that people really want, but there's a market that, uh, there, there are market conditions that we're trying to overcome, <coughs> trying to make that happen. And so we're trying to put in place the tools that uh, we think will be helpful. Part of that was to, through the incentive uh, reform with, with MAP, but it's also the change in philosophy. Uh, it's also trying to, trying to work uh, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with all of the things that are, we think are about to happen here that uh, we can try and, and uh, um, incentivize people to, to actually work in areas where, where they perceive that there's no market uh, at this point. And so we're trying to build that uh, such that we can get, get there. And so um, I, I think with the outcome of uh, the plan that we hope to be able to unveil here a little after the first of the year, and uh, the strategy that we hope to be able to move forward with, I hope, hopefully will be uh, better days to come. Okay. All right. Could I just uh, address a little bit about the affordable housing aspect? 
because um, I do just want to mention that the Skinker de Bolivar neighborhood especially is very committed to maintaining a mixed income neighborhood. Um, it's been a very successful neighborhood. They've been very vigilant over the years. They have Washington University right there, Forest Park. It's not the Central West End. I know it's very close and in a lot of ways it might not be distinguishable, but um, it was a red line neighborhood at one point. It's, it, it's had a different history than, than the Central West End. And the neighbors there are very committed, like I said, to, to maintaining the mixed income nature of their neighborhood. Neighborhood, and I'm, I'm, I'm confident that I speak for Alderman Clark Hubbard as well, that she and I are both committed to supporting them in that. And we've had a lot of robust conversations over the last year, with Pearl included, um, about how we do that. There is a, a housing corporation in the neighborhood, um, and there's a very diverse representation on the Skinker Bolivar Community Council, and so that is something that we as a neighborhood are addressing. We feel like we have taken this project and maximized the benefits to the city as much as possible, have tightened up this deal as much as possible. Um, I think it is a really um, positive benefit not just for the neighborhood but for the city and for pushing development farther north um, because it does connect up to up to Del Mar so that's why I think that in the long run this is going to be good for the city and I think we are making changes to our, our incentive reform that are help that have helped shape this project into being better than probably what it would have been um, in the past um, so but I do take your your comments to heart and I, I represent the 28th so I can only bring forward development projects in the 28th but I, I do agree that as a city we need to be looking at how we can be incentivizing development in, in other parts of, of the city as, as well. Any other questions, Alderman? Um, Alderman Hubbard, any questions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I um, don't have any questions, but I do have uh, some comments, and it's almost uh, as if my colleague from the 22nd was just tap dancing in my head or just listening to what I wanted to say regarding these projects. And whereas I um, do believe that both the sponsors of the bill uh, definitely worked hard to try to make sure that you all were doing what was in the best interest of the community and just how we structure things in regards to tips and development and stuff like that. But I. I think we can negate the fact that although we've been hearing this thing about there's going to be some changes, well, the leadership hasn't changed that much at, at um, SLDC over the years. And uh, we have a new mayor now, but our, our predecessor was there a long time. And so when we, come, when we start looking at most basic things as far as development and creating incentives and spurring growth into uh, – one portion of town and just leaving a, the, a whole half of the city dead, then it makes you think, okay, well, what type of mind frame were, were these entities in to even allow that to happen? I mean, it's almost like Team Four playing all over again, and it speaks volumes when, if as a city or as a development agency, if we tighten up and say, okay, well, look, you, you want to build up in, in the Central Corridor, but hey, if you go two blocks, North into North St. Louis, where I mean, there's little, in my war, we had uh, we were able to land NGA because we had whole blocks with one house on it. I mean, there's like a sprawl of space for people to develop, and until we set a precedent or set a tone as a city that okay, this this area is uh, oversaturated. I mean, this this area over here is, is not as dense as it used to be. How, how do we bring that back? And we keep hearing these conversations about the, the curve and it's gonna, it's gonna turn. But I mean, I had to just like fight like hell to get a hospital. You know, we, when we landed NGA, we had to agree that we wouldn't have them up there on an island. So I feel I should be seeing a gazillion projects such as this around in that footprint. And I mean, it's just, we, we definitely support the project. I'm pro-development. I'll, I'll, I'll never go against what the best interest is uh, of the represent, representatives in that uh, ward because they were elected to leave. But I think as a city, we tired of hearing the same thing. We tired of seeing the same type of bills come before us. And I don't know if, uh, I know we have a map. We're trying to do certain things with incentive reform and, and all of that. But with the residential piece of it, we, we need to do a better job. We, we just do because, you know, when you break down the numbers and a studio is going for $1,000, I mean, in my neighborhood, the neighborhood I live in, Car Square, you can get a three or four bedroom for under $1,000. So we, we need to look at it, and it's my hope that uh, we aren't just constantly just saying the same thing and nothing has been done about it. And um, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if there will probably be another meeting, or I know 
there's all these things in place uh, as far as them laying out these strategic plans and all of that. But I think we really need to see uh, a timeline for when that rubber will actually meet the road in regard to housing, affordable housing and development uh, within North St. Louis. Yeah. And that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alderman. I, I don't want to side hijack the meeting here, but I, I guess I'm hearing two different things from both your comments and the comments of the Alderman from the 22nd. And I, I want to make sure I understand them. Um, on one issue, uh, or, or one of the issues was raised was the, the inclusion of affordable housing within these projects. A and um, I, I think historically when we've looked at that, it, it, each unit of affordable housing adds another fifty to sixty thousand dollars of subsidy, um, which then indirectly comes out of the school system, which some people would argue is contributing to the the reason we're losing families in the city. So when we include affordable housing, assuming that we're underwriting correctly and, and we're not having you know more subsidy than we should then the question is 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 it is it more important for us to have affordable housing included in these projects or is it more important for that extra incentive to go to the school system i i'm a i'm a, a white guy from a ward that's experiencing a tremendous amount of redevelopment that's not my decision to make i'm hoping that the affordable housing study that we do raises that and some of the other questions that we have about displacement and uh, those types of things in a format that's, you know, more at the community at large, but is kind of on a parallel track with us down here so that we can begin hearing that conversation. And that's part of what the RFP for the affordable housing study is gonna do. As, as we say this, for example, and I don't know the answers to these things, that's why I'm looking for these studies and frankly f input from you if in fact the rents in the central corridor go up and it becomes more expensive and people can't live there but they still want to work close to where the jobs are at, at my experience that actually pushes that demand to the next neighborhood over and I think I've experienced that and that, you know I'm not saying I'm an expert on this but I think that's what happened in the West End and Forest Park Southeast. I think as the property values got more and more expensive in the West End and there were fewer sites available, I think some of that demand pushed to the south of Highway 40 and started creating demand in Forest Park Southeast and that has led to, to some of the redevelopment. I, that may be an overly simplistic view of the world, um, but I, I think it's important that this conversation happens. I hope that it happens, you know, as we do the affordable housing study. The other thing that I would like to, uh, you know, have us begin exploring is having the planning department come over here. We we're supposed to be hiring some more planners. And uh, uh, my personal experience is, is planning acts as a uh, catalyst for development. So we, we should probably at some point take a look at having Don Rowe come over and tell us what's going on in that area. I hope that it addresses, and I, I you know, we need to have, this conversation it, needs to it, happen a lot more, but not necessarily in a committee setting here. Right. Well, more than welcome to talk to right. you and, and the alderman from the 22nd, uh, more about that. Thank you though for your Thank comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, alderman Kotar. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and I'm sorry if I missed this, uh, Alderman Navarro, the, is the is the structured parking? It's going to be underground. Is that right? Correct. Is that going to be basically where the lot is currently? So, uh, if you look at the footprint um, on page four. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah. I mean, underneath, pretty much from uh, Waterman. Waterman and then heading south. I mean, that's going to be all underground parking. Correct. Yeah. And, and did Mr. Richardson say you'll be able to, will you be able to walk? So will you have to come up to street grade and then go back down? Or will you be able to go straight to the Metrolink stop? Because the Metrolink's below grade there, right? It'll be, you'll be able to go down. So you'll, you can pull into the, to the, uh, the park and ride lots. And that'll be in this southern 
uh, building. Yep. And it will then slope down so that you can be directly at the track level, as opposed to right now you have to yeah. go up. And we instituted universal design, so there'll be no stairs from, there'll be no stairs, we instituted universal design, so there'll be no stairs from when you pull into the public parking, get out of your car, and walk all the way to, there'll be a, a long Just, ramp, you could walk all the way to the metro stop. Oh, great, yeah. okay. Um, is this, I don't want to labor on the trolley, is, I know there's a TDD for the trolley up on Delmar, does that come down this way, does it take in this? Retail, this existing retail? It does, so the retail here would have a 1% TDD sales tax that would go to the trolley. Okay. Put a trolley in the rendering. I saw the trolley in the rendering. I can't tell if there's people on it or not. <laughs> <laughs> or if it's parked there. <laughs> um, nothing further. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Always a smart character. Okay, Al Alderwoman Boyd, any questions? I don't have questions. I just have a comment. I congratulate you all for taking this venue together. But I kept hearing, uh, and I hear a lot of developments that come before us. And let's be realistic about the whole thing. Most of the developments that come before us are in the Central West End. They're, they're not in the North Quarter. The North Quarter has been forgotten. And so I keep hearing you all say, we're building, we're going to have to go up. So that's telling me you don't have space to go out. But it's real interesting. No developers approach any other people in North Quarter and they have land. When I tell you they have land, we have land. But it's, it's just real interesting. And, and when I asked as a freshman, older person about affordable housing, and I said, well, I wouldn't mind having affordable housing. Oh, we got enough affordable housing. So that message is sent to me saying, it's only for one part of the city and it's not for the other part of the city. And so I don't think you all are paying attention, but you are still discriminating. You're still separating a city. And it's not working together. SLDC is not pulling it together. And I feel North Quarter has been okay. told for how many years, just give us a little more time. And, and I just don't feel we should keep giving people time. They need to produce. Because when I tell you 22nd, 27th, second wars, they have land that they, developers can have a ball with. It'll be like candy store. They have that much land. But I keep hearing people saying we have to go up. So that's just kind of sending a bad message to me because I've been fighting for a while for the North Quarter and saying, okay, when is it time to start moving on that side? And I just don't see it happen. I congratulate you all for working as a team, but I just feel like, you know, again, we're left out of the whole scenario. So I, I just... I'm not happy with the whole process, but I hope the best for what you all are doing. Now, was it a, a good year or a Dobbs over there that you all are getting ready to take that out? Because it was some kind of auto repair place that used to be over there. Under Bolivar? I... And I knew it was a problem that you all had. It had a fence around it. I can picture it like everything. Are you thinking about, there's a pro are you thinking about Delmar? That's on there's a, okay. Yeah. Cause I, and, and Jack took my question because my question was, well, where was the trolley? Because I didn't see the trolley part. So yeah. I was yeah, confused the on there. that. But congratulations on you all working together. I appreciate that. Well, thank you for your, your comments. I think one thing that I think is beneficial about this project is that from an environmental point of view, building up and increasing density is going to really help in terms of infrastructure costs. From an environmental point of view, it's, it's better in terms of what we're doing with um, impervious pavement, our wastewater systems, all of that. So there is a benefit just in general, I would say, to, to, to building up. And I really would like to incre increase the number of people who are moving into the city um, versus continuing the sprawl where we have to keep 
you know, we're paying to, you know, build roads and extend infrastructure so people can continue to live farther and farther away. So I think any time that we can be investing in housing opportunities in the city that we're going to be encouraging more, more growth. I think the benefit to this project being so close to the metro is that it does offer the opportunity for a variety of people um, to live there. You don't have to own a car. You don't have to have the expenses of a car to be able um, to live there. So I think that's a little bit more unique than some of maybe some of the other development projects we see is that, that it is making that opportunity available. I also just, in case this is helpful, I want to mention that the incentive reforms that have been taking place over the last few years have been helpful to me. I know the map that we that you referenced earlier, Alderwoman, about um, where tax abatements are available in the city. And I just want to let everyone know that I rely on that regularly. You will, I'm, I'm sure in the last few years, you have not seen an abatement project for a residential um, development under a million dollars come before the board because I rely on that and when I talk to developers I, I tell them straight up I'm going to share this map with you and if you are looking for abatement these are the areas of the city that we have mapped out and said we would like to encourage development in those areas so I just want you all to know that I do I, I take that seriously I use it on a regular basis and I do think it is helping us move in the right direction and it, it does help us send a signal to developers that we want to see development and growth um, not just in the central corridor but in these other areas of the city, and we're serious about that. So if, if that's helpful, I just want you to know that I, I do rely on that on a regular basis. Okay, uh, if there are no questions, the chair will entertain a motion on, um, let's see, I guess we need to go through these sequentially. The first of these would be the board bill number 168, which is, um, is that the board is it not? Um, this is the one um, designating um, the TOD redevelopment area, adopting and approving the TIF and redevelopment plan for construction of a mixed-use TOD. Okay. So, um, Chair will entertain a motion on Board Bill number 168. I move that we adopt Board Bill 168 with a due pass recommendation. Second. So moved and seconded. Previous roll. Been a request for previous roll. Hearing no objections. Uh, board Bill number 169, the chair will entertain a motion. I move that we adopt Board Bill 169 with a due pass recommendation. Second. Previous roll. Hearing no objection, Board Bill 169 is passed out of committee with a due pass recommendation. Board Bill number 170, the chair will entertain a motion. I move that we adopt Board Bill 170 with a due pass recommendation. <laughs> Previous roll. Moved and passed. Um, hearing no objections, we'll consider board bill number 170 passed out of committee with a due pass recommendation. Um, next up is uh, our colleague from the fifth ward has a uh, several board bills. Alderwoman. Sorry, go ahead, Alderwoman. Uh, do we have do, we have, do you have any handouts? Yes, we do. We have hand, handouts. Here's some, and we also have a, a slide show. Oh, we like slide shows. Well, not a slide show. It's on paper. Okay. <laughs> slide show on paper. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members uh, of the board, the committee. I'm here on behalf of board bills 157, 158, and 159. Um, they're kind of numbered odd, but uh, I'll, I guess I'll briefly go through and explain uh, what each, each bill does, and then I can just probably give a summary of the project and then have uh, any other partners or anyone from uh, SLDC <coughs> come up to answer or explain uh, any questions. So basically what Board Bill 159 does is it designates a, a portion of the city as 900 North Tucker Boulevard redevelopment area and adopts and approves TIF and redevelopment plan for the re rehabilitation and renovation of a mixed-use building containing office and commercial space. Um, Board Bill 157, it authorizes the redevelopment agreement with the developer in order to implement the project and enable uh, the developer to carry 
out the redevelopment plan and board bill 158 which authorizes the fin financing of a portion of the redevelopment cost of the project utilizing TIF and authorizing the issuance of revenue notes not to exceed $11.85 million. Uh, this is the scrap project that we have heard so much about in the media. It's, it's a complete blessing for my ward and for my community uh, to have them move to the fifth ward. Uh, I know they left a, a very nice place over in Cortex or they're leaving but they did sign a lease prior to this incentive package being put together. I think it's important uh, to note all of the community efforts that the, the owner uh, has put out there. They've done so much in regards to launch code and just definitely just introducing people in our uh, community into this type of industry. There's a disconnect in our community, especially uh, in the African-American community with people being in these type of jobs and, and in this type of industry. Uh, they could have moved their company anywhere else in the world. It's a very successful company, but I'm grateful to have them here moving to the Fifth Ward. Uh, the total project cost is approximately $69 million. Um, this will be a renovation of 278,000 square feet mixed-use building. It was the old post batch building. Uh, the building was, is definitely a jewel to our city. And uh, the most important piece to me is the jobs piece which is uh, 1,250 jobs, average salary of $76,500, and uh, in a community that has experienced 60 years of disinvestment, although it's downtown, but it's a stone's throw away from uh, the neighborhood that I live in, Car Square and Columbus Square, uh, and just other struggling areas in, in the Fifth Ward, I, I definitely uh, am grateful to see this come before us, and I hope that I could have your favorable support in this endeavor. And at this time, if you all have any specific questions regarding uh, the, the numbers, it, it, it scored pretty well. It, the score On the scorecard is a 4.75 out of 5. Um, we have people here that can speak to it if you all have any specific questions. And once again, I uh, ask for your favorable support on passage of board bills 157, 158, Before 159. we get into the financials, uh, I just want to make sure. It looks like you have back here a the now innovation district. Is that this isn't for the entire district? It is for the specific building, is it not? Just correct. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. And uh, is that for the nine the nine t nine oh one North Tenth as well? Then or is it? Oh, so that 901 North 10th. That's where the posts moved to then, is that right? Right, if, if you want me to walk you through the PowerPoint, which is trying to give some yeah. context there of what, uh, okay. what, what sure. happened. So yeah, the, the TIF, this is Dave Richardson with Hush Blackwell, the TIF is just for the 900 North Tucker building, the post-dispatch building, which, you know, would give you kind of a little bit of history there. The, you know, after Lee Enterprises bought the, um, took over the, um, post-dispatch in 2005, they started downsizing there. They moved the printing operations to Maryland Heights. Uh, they put the building up for sale in 2015. It's been on the market for over three years. And then my clients, which are Starwood Group, um, purchased it in September of 2018. And so at the time they purchased it, the only uh, tenant left was the Post Dispatch, who was occupying about 50,000 of that 278,000 square feet. And we've, um, what we did, though, is to keep the Post Dispatch downtown is we also bought 901 North 10th Street um, and rehabbed that building. So it's just to the east of the Post Dispatch building. Um, and we moved the Post Dispatch there. They leased 45,000 square feet out of that 75,000 square feet in that building. And uh, that was a $10 million project that um, we did without any incentives at all. But the goal there was to keep the Post Dispatch downtown. As uh, Ray Ferris, the publisher, said, they were uh, a 21st century media company that was operating out of a mid 20th century building. It didn't work for them anymore. So that's why we had that, <coughs> said that note. And then the now innovation district. So um, this is not going to just be a, a one off for my clients here. The goal is to actually, um, you know, uh, continue to, 
to grow and uh, tackle other buildings. And in that map of the now innovation district, again, the boundaries basically are uh, Cole to the north, Broadway to the east, uh, Washington to the south, and 14th to the west. And those are kind of just arbitrary. They don't have any legal meaning, but that's kind of the footprint of um, my clients have been working with uh, T-Rex and with SLDC and others to like, hey, this could be an emphasized uh, area for um, similar to what's uh, happening at Cortex, but downtown, taking some of the companies at T-Rex that graduate and finding them the space um, uh, in this northern part of downtown in the, in the Fifth Ward. And so, and what's highlighted in red, um, uh, the lots and buildings in there, is what my clients have purchased as part of, you know, uh, when they purchase the post-dispatch, they also purchase a bunch of surface parking lots as well as that uh, building where we moved the post-dispatch to. So that's kind of showing you the current holdings. And again, this is not just going to be uh, the post-dispatch building. This is to, you know, hopefully be the first of uh, a lot of development occurring in the, the Fifth Ward. Uh, if there's, uh, I think that gives us a good overview. Uh, uh, Mr. Ferry, if you want to come up and go through our nu your numbers with us. <clears throat> yeah, hello. Um, so uh, this project, again, is um, uh, go through the, the report that you guys have in front of you. Um, Again, we show that this project is, uh, when it comes to rate of return, it's, uh, it is without incentives, it is below sort of the, the typical range. It does get towards the higher end of the range with, uh, with the incentives, but, um, uh, but you know, we believe that because of the overall amount of uh, benefit that the project provides to the city that, um, uh, that this is a project we can support uh, fully. Um, you can see there, over 10 years, this project will generate about $15.5 million in gross revenue, uh, and the city's portion uh, of that will be $5.9 million. Um, for these types of jobs, uh, we don't include them in the substitution effect, but they are included, uh, particularly the ones that are already uh, at Cortex, are included in the baseline revenue, uh, which is $5.2 million. So, um, the net new revenue to the city is about $4.3 million over um, the first 10 years. It's about 202000 in net new revenue to the school district over that same time period. Uh, when you look uh, over a longer horizon of 30 years, uh, we have um, $45 million is expected over 30 years from this project. Um, for a project of sort of this land area size, you would uh, expecting the city on average a commercial property to generate three and a half million dollars uh, over 30 years and for something that is sort of uh, within the downtown area it would generate about 36 million dollars so this project uh, outperforms the average downtown property by over 25 uh, percent and because of that it, it gets 4.75 out of 5. Um, the only reason it didn't get a perfect score is because of that increment score because so much of it is already sort of in the city included in that baseline that's the only thing that kept it from getting a five um, but it's a 69.7 million dollar uh, investment that uh, that doesn't include an additional 10 million I don't believe that's going to be invested by the tenant um, not by the developer um, but overall the the project does well it, the um, a TIF should pay off by 2035, uh, and um, the break-even from the city's cost standpoint uh, is only two years, so it should happen by 2022. Okay. Um, uh, if there's... Uh Nothing else in presentation. We've heard earlier from the comptroller. The comptroller's in agreement with this. Um, yes, the comptroller's in agreement with this. Okay. Uh, Alderman Boyd, any questions? No questions. Um, Alderman Kotar, any questions? Yeah, briefly. Um, looking at the last page of the slide, I know you've got, you're estimating about 1,100 square jobs. How much of the uh, 270,000 square feet of office space is square taking, uh, and how much will be, I guess, marketed for other tenants? 
So 226,000 is for square. Oh, wow. Okay. And then, uh, so that leaves us another 50,000 that is, is, is available. I have nothing further. Uh, older woman from the uh, 27th? No question. Okay. There's no questions. Uh, despite the fact that the 17th Ward is losing some jobs over this, we are... Uh, <laughs> You'll fill that space. Um, this is, uh, I think, what we talk about with some of the spinoff effect that these things happen. Um, the, uh, we'll call for our entertain a motion that we uh, pass. I guess we want to go through sequentially again. Uh, start out with board bill number 159. Or, oh, I'm sorry, Seven. that's not 157. Excuse me, I'm in reverse order here. I move that we adopt Board Bill 157 with a due pass recommendation. Second. It's been moved by the Alderman from the 7th, seconded by the Alderwoman from the 27th. The Alderwoman from the... Yeah, we have a form here. Uh, the Alderwoman from the um, 10th asked uh, Matt to be included in the previous role, so we'll have to do a um, roll call. Uh, she said not to be. Yes, she asked not to be included. She asked that we do a roll call. <laughs> All the one, I'm sorry, Alderman Boyd. Aye. Alderwoman Davis. Alderman Ornowitz. Alderwoman Hubbard. Aye. Alderman Kotar. Aye. Alderwoman Spencer. Alderman Oldenburg. Alderwoman Boyd. Aye. Chairman Rohde. Aye. That's five aye votes. By your uh, vote, we've uh, passed out a board bill number uh, 157 with the new pass recommendation. Um, Chair will entertain a motion on board bill number 158. I move that we adopt board bill 158 with the due pass recommendation. Second. It's been moved by the alderman from the 7th. Previous role. by the alderman, alderwoman from the 27th to request for previous role. Hearing no objection, we'll consider board bill number 158 passed out of committee with the due pass recommendation. Chair will entertain a motion on board bill number 159. I move that we adopt board bill 159 with a due pass recommendation. Second. Previous roll. Been moved, seconded, and a request for previous roll. Hearing no objection, we'll consider board bill number 159 as heard and passed out of committee with a due pass recommendation. Thank you. Congratulations, Alderwoman. Excited for that project to get moved forward. Um, been pretty busy. Uh, <laughs> uh, no. Voting present still continues. Contributes to the forum, does it not? I don't know, because I have to abstain. Is an abstain a no? Sweeney will know. Hey, Dave, real quick. Okay, uh, last up is a, uh, a board bill for a project that uh, it's a municipal ports building next door. It's in the 7th Ward. Our colleague from the 7th has a conflict and is asked to, uh, 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 to put on record that he plans to abstain on this. Uh, in, uh, lack, uh, in the absence of a sponsor, I agreed to sponsor it. It's my understanding that this is for a um, project that was previously approved by our committee. However, uh, uh, the project has ran into some difficulty and they are extending the, the um, window of time for completion for a one-year time period. Uh, is there someone present that can speak to Board Bill 160? Or I, I'm not really sure if there's much to add beyond that. Um, My colleague Rob Preston is here. Okay. Good morning. Hi, Rob. How are, Thank you. Preston. Good morning. How are you today? Great. Um, do you have anything update that we should know about or an explanation for why it was continued or, or uh... yeah I can give you a little bit of background the uh, after the the tip was approved um, the developer acquired the property from the city and uh, it was subject to an automatic reversionary right that will go back cause the property to go back to the city at the end of the year if they don't close on their financing um, the uh, the Construction period is anticipated to be about 14 months, so closing by the end of the year would put the uh, would put the substantial completion into early 2021. So we're looking for a short extension to uh, to accommodate that. Um, 
the project was delayed from its original fashion. Um, change of administration in Jeff City caused a lot of projects in the city difficulties getting brownfield tax credits approved. Um, so the developer's been finding ways to plug the, uh, the funding deficit caused by the, those credits not being awarded. And refresh our memory, this is a, ho do you have, uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, this is a hotel. Do you have some renderings or what? I sure kind of do. An overview of it. I don't know. Is the will of the committee to go through all the financials again and everything, or is it no. not necessary? No. Okay. I certainly don't want to preclude anybody from asking any questions. So I brought some of the, um, just to print out a couple copies of the handouts, the PowerPoint from the presentation we made roughly two years ago when this project well, was originally I, if approved. There's not a, we've been down here for quite a while. If there's not a, a particular strong interest, um, certainly one field pass. So, and, and just out of interest, since it's right out your window, it's about 140 some room hotel. Um, some of the old courthouses will be converted into common amenities, restaurants, bars, et cetera. This new iteration to plug the hole created by the lack of the brownfields, the developer intends to put like a family entertainment concept on the second floor, which would be, uh, think of it like an arcade for adults, table games, et cetera. Okay. Um, if there's, uh, we'll go through, and if there's any questions, we'll certainly slow down. Or copies I don't want to make anybody feel like they're rushed. Alderman Boyd, do you have any Sure. Good morning, Preston. Preston, right? Rob Preston, yes, sir. Rob Preston, yeah. Um, <coughs> if I remember correctly, um, the city lot on 14th and Clark is supposed to be part of this development, correct? So, kind of. It's a two, um, the TIF originally covered both parcels, the municipal courts building, the parking lot behind. Mm -hmm. the, the, the parking lot is a second redevelopment project area that hasn't been activated or approved yet. So this um, just pertains to the hotel piece, the, the courthouse. So where will your parking be? So the parking right now, there's um, ongoing discussions with the, the comptroller's office and the treasurer's office. Um, if those are successful, they'll be parking on that lot. Otherwise, the, the developers having conversations with um, existing garages for valley service. But for some reason, I remember in Ways and Means there was a bill that came through for the sale of that lot specifically for this development. Am I thinking of a different development? So in Ways and Means, we had, um, I'm trying to remember, we are tangentially involved in that back parking lot development. So I know some, but not everything about, about what's happening there, there's, there's been, um, I think you're right about that, that it tried to get pushed through, but it was never no follow-up. It was, a, so there was a, oh, I, I, there was a bill approving the sale, but there was a number of conditions to approve that sale, uh, including a reimbursement to the treasurer uh, at an amount to be determined. So that, I don't believe, has been, that has not been accomplished yet. So the sale has not actually been finalized. It has been portion of it has been approved by the board, but the land hasn't transferred. There's been no agreement on a sale, a final price that would include a reimbursement for the parking. So let me ask you this. How many parking spots will you need for the hotel? What's required by? It's, it's about a hundred and so 140 rooms mm -hmm. um, plus the, the operators typically like to have a handful of additional rooms for staff and special events. And right now you, you don't have an agreement with anybody to provide those parking spaces, is that correct? Uh, I, I think they have um, opportunities with some of the local existing parking structures that have a capacity to handle something like this. Nothing's been inked though is my understanding. I, I, I guess I'm just a little confused at why you would move forward on something without having an agreement for parking um, because that could really throw you off if you don't have some people that are willing to be partners with you and or your parking may end up being a premium because if I own the garage and I know you need parking then I might want to charge you event price parking rates 
instead of the normal rates that you would, daily rates you would pay, let's say if you're a sky trade or whatever. So I'm just, why, why would you want to move in that direction? Mr. Chairman, can I address? Sure. Please. Sure. Okay. Please. So uh, we recently had a meeting with all of the stakeholders in the city to, to be the comptroller. Can you speak up just a little bit for uh, me? We recently met with uh, the other stakeholders in the city, the comptroller, the treasurer's office, and with the, the developer and the developer's team. So uh, this is really at the last point where I think the city team is now planning to meet with uh, the developer to work out the parking issue. What I think uh, uh, what he's asking for is to try and ensure that uh, the agreement stays in place until that can be worked out, and it, it, it is uh, moving in the right direction. So, uh, how long are we extending this? It is a six-month extension. Are, are you sure that's enough? Uh, it, it yes, be because uh, when I say yes, <laughs> because there are some deadlines that I think the developer really is trying to meet uh, as far as lending. I mean, if the cost of money is really trying to push this, and so uh, I think uh, they are working uh, to try and get it resolved, and I can talk to you more. I mean, I, I, I certainly support the project. I, I, I mean, I understand politics, too, and I would just hope that you don't get caught up in a snag where we're doing a six-month extension and you, you may need a year extension. I mean, it's been two years already, um, so. But it's the, in the nittier, grittier details, they've, um, they have financing on the table. One of the conditions of the loan is to, is to extend the, uh, the construction period so that they can ensure that the, the project can be completed within the term of the loan. So the financing is available. Okay. No further questions, Mr. Chairman. And, and, and just as, as an aside on, on the hotels, it's becoming a modern trend in more urban hotels that the hotel really doesn't provide any parking. Um, valet is optional with, with a relationship with some lots, but many patrons opt for a cheaper self-park option. Um, Alder Woman Hubbard, any questions? No questions. Um, Alder Woman Boyd. No questions. Okay. Uh, having um, no other questions, the chair will entertain a motion on board bill 160. I move to pass board bill 160 out of committee with a due pass recommendation. Second. It's been moved and seconded. I'll request previous roll. Hearing no objection. Oh, I'm sorry. We. Oh, okay. I forgot. I forgot. Okay, I think we're ready. 
You're you're a woman in demand. <laughs> okay, I think we are all uh, ready. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderman Boyd. Aye. Alderwoman Davis. Alderman Ornowitz. Alderwoman Hubbard. Aye. Alderman Coltar. Abstain. Alderwoman Spencer. Alderman Oldenburg. Alderwoman Boyd. Aye. Chairman Brody. Four I votes and one abstain. Great. Um, by your vote, we've passed out of uh, committee board bill number 160. I believe that concludes today's uh, meeting or uh, work for today. We have another, our next meeting is on, I believe it's December the 10th, if, whatever that went, 11th, December the 11th. Uh, we will have the uh, update on the economic development plan at that point, and we should have probably a pretty full agenda. So um, you might schedule a time accordingly during the lunch. Thanks, everyone, Thanks, for, Chairman. for your time. <laughs>